I'm going to call to order the <clears throat> July 15, 2021 uh, meeting of the Delta Protection Commission and thank all who've joined with us this afternoon and we have a pretty full agenda. So with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, are there any announcements that the clerk needs to make, Eric, before we get started and I'll ask somebody, I see we have the flag slew, so we'll do that in here in a moment. But is there any announcements that need, need to be made? No, not, nothing we have. Okay, so with that, um, if um, we have a flag and uh, if you'll rise oh, in your kidding. place of Zoom and we'll, no, as Nancy, would you lead us in the pledge? Nancy Bogle, please. Commissioner Bogle. The process 10 to 12. I, here we go. I pledge allegiance That's not to the flag, the flag of the United States of America, America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, stand, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty with liberty and justice. And justice <laughs> Got it. Good. Good. Very good. That was pretty much in unison too. And you know, so thank you, thank you, uh, Commissioner Bogle. I appreciate that. Okay. With that, then let's go ahead and uh, do the roll call to uh, uh, formally establish a quorum. And uh, our work, uh, thank you, uh, Justin. If you could help mute everybody while we do roll. Thank you. All right. Chair Natoli. Here. Thank you, Stacey. Vice Chair Wynn. Vice Chair Wynn. Commissioner Viegas. Uh, I know he's coming in a little bit, so Commissioner Burgess. Is that the second yeah. river in the background? Is it the river? Yeah. Running? The um, I, I don't I don't know who LP is. If that's a commission member, we'd love to hear from you. But otherwise, yeah, please uh, keep that one muted. Thank you. Just in case, Commissioner Burgess, Commissioner Vasquez, I'm here. Commissioner Fuller, here. Commissioner Steele. I did see him on the list, so you might need to unmute yourself. Commissioner Steele. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm here. Commissioner Steele, I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Nakanishi. Here. Commissioner Paroli. Here. Commissioner Slater. Here. Commissioner Moosey. Commissioner Moosey. Commissioner Agar. Uh, present. Commissioner Eddie. Present. Commissioner Vogel. Present. Commissioner Bush. Here. And ex officio assembly member Frazier. Okay, thank you. Chair Natoli, we have 11 commissioners present for a quorum. Okay, so we do have a quorum and again, welcome to all and thank you uh, for your attention today. Let me just, uh, as we get started, thank you states for calling the uh, roll. Um, just wanna put a statement into the record too that um, we are meeting today, as uh, everyone's well aware, remotely via Zoom, um, but members of the public can join uh, by telephone uh, by calling uh, number, I believe it's listed on the agenda, but I'll just put it out there uh, in case somebody doesn't have, have it uh, handy. 1-888-363-4738. Uh, and then entering the conference code, which is uh, again, 388754. Um, the information is located at the top of the media agenda and uh, all the meme materials are also located at the website www.delta.cal.gov. Uh, for public comment, please use raise the hand. Uh, and I think I see it on the screen, so I don't want to be redundant here. Uh, and if you're joining by phone, however, please um, 
uh, indicate you'd like to make a public comment, press press two on your telephone, and uh, you'll. <clears throat> and that will also, again, when once you've spoken, you can remove raising your hand by pressing two again. So, so thanks to everyone for attending via Zoom, and hopefully one of these days soon we'll be able to chance to see folks uh, again in person. But uh, we um, again have a very full agenda. So with that, uh, we'll go to. Um, uh, item three on our agenda, which is time for uh, public comment. And as noted on the screen, uh, this is an opportunity for folks to comment on any items that are not on the agenda. So I would turn to our clerk and um, ask if we have anyone on the phone to, or via Zoom, that wishes to address matters not on the agenda. Do we have anyone? Uh, no hands raised. Okay. All right. Thanks, Justin. My apologies. I didn't realize I was on mute. Oh, we've got a good sense, Stacey. Okay. So again, for those that are public, anybody that's following us, this is your opportunity, not on the agenda items. And if if I no one comes forward, then we're going to keep moving down into the uh, regular order of business. So Stacey, anybody raised hands? There are still no raised hands at this time. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. So quickly moving down the agenda, um, item four, um, time for the chair to make any report on Delta Stewardship Council activities. Um, uh, by way of a brief uh, note, um, the uh, Stewardship Council is was in session this morning and will again resume session tomorrow. Uh, the bulk of the agenda is uh, devoted to uh, consideration of the appeal on the lookout slew item and uh, there are some other items at the end of uh, that item uh, tomorrow that will be taken up relating to um, contracts with, uh, for additional support for the Independent Science Board and um, also um, working with the um, collaborative efforts that help get the word out for efforts uh, that the Stewardship Council is involved in through uh, working with the Association of Bay Area Governments. And then we will also have a lead scientist report and pretty abbreviated agenda um, uh, due to the a length of the uh, of, of the one item, so that's all I have. Unless there's any questions by my colleagues about uh, anything else, uh, uh, I assume in, in August we'll uh, have a you know a full agenda with other orders of work on there. No, I don't see no no questions or any further comments. So with that, then I'll move down to item five, which now is opportunity for a commissioner comments or announcements. So any member of the commission have announcements or, or items you wish to put forward? If I may, Mr. Chair, this is sure. Dennis Akar with Caltrans. Yes, Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, good afternoon, um, commissioners. Uh, just a couple updates I wanted to share that may be of interest uh, to the commission. Uh, with Caltrans. Um, one is I normally would provide a uh, update to the Delta project map. Uh, that has not been updated since the last time we met, so those are still valid. Uh, the one thing I do want to share, and, and maybe I can send the link through the um, chat uh, to the to the clerk, um, uh, a portal, a project portal page that is accessible to the general public for all of our Caltrans projects that are going across the state. There's actually even access to a virtual map, uh, GIS, uh, which provides uh, a lot of information on our projects. Uh, like I said, in, in, in Caltrans that are planned uh, or uh, uh, program at a certain uh, phase of a project. So I'd like to share that with everybody. There is a, a link uh, to get to those projects. If you are interested beyond just our Delta map, and the other other update I wanted to provide, uh, as some of you may have seen, uh, Caltrans uh, effort on the July 7th statewide uh, media event that we held for the Clean California Initiative. Uh, there's a lot of work that uh, Caltrans is doing uh, to date in regarding kicking that off. For District 10, uh, just for the information, uh, we did hold our own uh, specific. Uh, Clean California um, a media event on June 24th uh, with the city of Stockton, uh, the county supervisor in San Joaquin, um, and it was a great event to, to kick that off here in District 10. Uh, if those who don't know about Clean California, and there is a cleancalifornia.org uh, uh, 
um, COM uh, webpage, you can get more information. I will also share uh, through the chat um, a, a two page fact sheet on what Clean California is and the focus areas of it engaging into our communities, uh, public education, expanding our litter abatement program uh, across the state. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, enhancing our infrastructure as well with beautification projects, uh, whether it's in our state right away uh, or even in our local uh, communities, uh, there is a local grant uh, contribution here, 30% uh, of the $1.5 billion for the next three years uh, will be uh, available uh, through applications uh, for beautification projects on city or county public uh, space, or uh, we have a certain amount of dollars also uh, for beautification projects within our own uh, state highway system. So I wanted to share a little bit more about that. Again, I'll, I'll share a two page fact sheet uh, for those who are interested if you wanted to know more. And I'm excited to, to just say that uh, maybe there's opportunities here in the Delta region uh, to partner uh, for some either beautification gateway projects uh, into uh, the Delta region. Uh, and that could be coordinated uh, with all three of the districts that fall into this area, whether it's district four or district three um, in, in uh, our respective districts. So I just wanted to share that, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gajar. And that's, that's exciting and it's, uh, it's good news. And, and uh, I think sending that information forward, uh, Dennis, would be real helpful. And uh, I trust there may be some of our member entities here that will be interested in uh, pursuing you know, some of those cooperative uh, projects, but certainly um, maybe offer some suggestions and support for those efforts. So thank you very much. That's real helpful. Any uh, other comments or questions of uh, Commissioner Agar or any other uh, items people want to comment on? Yes, uh, this is uh, Council Steele. Yes. Mr. Ahan, I'd like to ask you a question about that grant money you're talking about. You said that it's for uh, local and county roads. Is that, am I correct on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so to expand on that, uh, again, one third of the $1.5 billion for the next three years will be allocated uh, to the cities, the counties, tribal authorities, and even transit agencies uh, to assist with this effort that we're trying to do um, across the state. And this will be handled through local uh, grant applications. And just to expand on my update, I didn't want to take a whole lot of time on this, but District 10, and I'm sure all three districts that are involved in the region are putting an implementation team together. My hope is that once I get that person on board, if the commission is willing, I would like to have that person provide a uh, presentation uh, to this commission or the right appropriate um, advisory committee here for the Delta to expand on the local grant applications and partnership opportunities here in the Delta region. Commissioner Steele, did you have any other questions? Did it, that, I think it Hold on. I'm not gonna use a lot more time. I'll just let him know. I'll, I have this recording right now and I'll give this to my city manager and uh, try to get a hold of you about that, see if we can make something work. We have some uh, roads out here around the, the city and surrounding areas around the county. They're in really bad uh, disrepair off the levees and uh, we could use that money uh, tremendously. Thank you very much. Great. It, um, <clears throat> And I would just know, Commissioner Agar, Agar that um, I know that the folks in, in, in you and Caltrans uh, uh, in certainly District 3 have been working with the Free, Freeport community and they've been looking at doing a gateway uh, improvement uh, uh, from the uh, northbound approach into the town of Freeport on Highway 160. And so it sounds like there may be an opportunity. I know they've applied to the um, Conservancy, Delta Conservancy under the Prop 68 for at least a planning grant and been working with County, uh, Sacramento County Department of Transportation. And uh, and I would just point that out. That's a, an opportunity for maybe, you know, for some of this partnering, some of the, the dollars that you mentioned be available. So I look forward to that information as well. So and I'm sure other counties as well as cities as Paul's pointed out. So, okay, very good, exciting. And, and, I, and I think it's a good suggestion. Once you get your implementation person on board, we would certainly, I, and, you know, welcome the opportunity to have them present to the commission. So 
Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You bet. Okay. Any others? Uh, uh, Stacy, we have anybody else? Yes, Raise Commissioner them. Eddie has his hand raised. Okay, Commissioner Eddie. Perfect. Thank you, Chair Natale. I appreciate Good. it. Uh, just a couple of quick updates from the Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, as you know, as we're entering and in, in, in the current kind of drought period, we are working with our federal partners at the USDA for drought resources for farmers and ranchers. The department maintains a uh, drought website, and that's accessible from our main website, cdfa.ca.gov, where it lists all the variety of resources that your um, stakeholders are able to access in terms of helping and assisting in this, these drought conditions. Um, in addition, um, CDFA just announced a 10 million dollar COVID relief grant um, application period for specialty crop block grant programs. And that's something that I know that the commission is familiar with. There is definitely that opportunity uh, for um, organizations, nonprofit organizations, et cetera, et cetera, to promote the competitiveness of specialty crops in the region through enhanced tourism, et cetera. And in response to uh, COVID-19, that might be something that the commission may want to consider or a variety of stakeholders listening on the call. The application deadline for that is coming up very quickly, August 8th. Um, and all that information is also available on our website. And I can share that information with um, the executive director as well. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, that's something with a short deadline, and maybe we want to try to push that out. Uh, Eric, uh, is that something we can get pushed out to some of our partner entities and uh, folks that are on our list? Yeah, yeah, we can put it through our normal channels, but also do a more targeted approach for people that we think would have a particular interest in. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it, Commissioner Eddie. Okay. Others. We have no hands raised. Thank you, Stacy. Well, those are that's two good, good good bits of news, and certainly the, the drought will challenge all of us. But uh, appreciate the, um, our state partner sharing the information, and we'll see if we can help <clears throat> uh, bring some of those dollars and efforts to the to the delta. All right. Um, if there's no more announcements, certainly we you know as we close the meeting, if you think of something, we can come back to that later on. So uh, that takes us down then to our consent agenda. And uh, on that, we have our uh, minutes of uh, approving the minutes from the May 20th meeting. And uh, I trust folks have had a chance to take a look at uh, look at the minutes. Are there any uh, corrections or modifications people want to offer? Okay, sounds like you got them all right, Stacey. <laughs> they got 100 percent i'd love to take credit but i can't take credit for that one. okay well, whoever take, well whoever's done taking the minutes did a good job okay with that then uh uh do we have any public comment on uh the consent item anybody raising a hand no we have no hands raised at the moment okay then uh, the chair would entertain a motion uh, for approval so i'm going to be agus okay second second uh agar Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> Motion by Commissioner Vegas, uh, second by Commissioner Agar. And uh, if there's no comments or questions, then this will require a roll call vote. So uh, with that, uh, please call the roll. Chair Natoli. Aye. Vice Chair Wynn. Commissioner Viegas. Aye. Commissioner Burgess. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Aye. Commissioner Steele? I abstain. Commissioner Nakanishi? <laughs> Commissioner Nakanishi, you might need to unmute yourself. Yeah, it, it's star two, not, I'm sorry, pound two, Commissioner Nakanishi. Okay, we'll come back. Come back, yeah, come back in. Commissioner Paroli. Aye. Commissioner Slater. Aye. Commissioner Moosey. Commissioner Agar? Aye. Commissioner Eddy? Aye. Commissioner Vogel? Aye. 
I'm going to come back around to Commissioner Nakanishi. You can also try, I believe it's star nine on your phone. There we go. And, and Commissioner Bush as well, uh, Clerk Caden. Thank you. I see Commissioner Nakanishi trying to come up. Do we have a vote from you? All right, and Commissioner Bush? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Chair Natoli, we have 10 yeses and one abstain and one commissioner having some communication. Yeah, we, 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 can, we can hold it open. It's been approved, but if Commissioner Nakanishi gets um, connected so he can uh, register to vote, we can, I would just do chair's discretion, hold the vote open if he wishes to register a vote on the, on the minutes, so. Okay, um, but we did have enough for approval. So with that, let's um, go to the executive director's report then. And uh, Eric, turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair and commission members. Um, just a few things I will highlight from my written report. Um, the Delta Conveyance Project, uh, as probably all commissioners know, DWR is still proceeding with a preparation of an environmental impact report that is anticipated in April or May of 2022. Um, on broadband, we're working toward an application for federal funding with two local consortia and still encouraging Delta residents to take the Cal speed test and report their internet speeds. And that's real easy to do with the CalSpeed app that you can download on your mobile devices. Uh, the Great Delta Trail Commission staff uh, surveyed the community on trail preferences. That uh, input will be folded into and will help inform the draft master plan, which we're expecting by this fall. And we anticipate coming to the commission for review at the November 2021 meeting. Uh, moving to internal matters, the commission, uh, uh, we're a half month into fiscal year 2021-22. And as of July 1st, the Department of General Services is now handling our administrative support functions under contract. And we also wish to specifically thank the great team that worked with us for many years at the State Lands Commission. And Commissioner Bush, I, I'm sure you know, but we're greatly appreciative of all of the great support we received from the State Lands Commission team. And um, we're uh, getting to know a great new group of support members at the Department of General Services. And speaking of Commissioner Bush, I don't want to steal his thunder, but one great outcome in the uh, budget deliberations. I think it was in the baby budget bill, not in the main budget bill. And I, I meant to check. I don't even know if this has yet been signed into law by the governor, but I think it's pretty well secure. Is $12 million for the State Lands Commission to support abandoned and derelict vessel removal in the Delta. And I'm sure that Assemblyman Frazier had his uh, involvement all over that issue. And for that, we thank him. Um, and if Commissioner Bush would like to add anything at the conclusion, um, that would be great. But as we learn more details, I think that's an item that would be of great interest to many commission members. And we will report that back at future meetings. Uh, the land use comments and upcoming events are included in the report. I won't highlight those. Um, I do wanna highlight the metrics from both social media and the websites and pay particular note to the fact that visitcadelta.com has had a pretty dramatic uh, increase, a more than doubling from the first quarter to the second quarter in visits to that website. Um, it's not a bot, it's all for real. And we suspect that's because um, you know, people are looking at the Delta as a potential recreation location as we head into summer. 
but it's just been a very dramatic increase in website traffic to that site, which of course tickles us uh, tremendously. And we hope that uh, that will just continue to grow in the future. Again, visit cadelta.com. Um, I think that covers it. I, we don't wanna say anything more about Lookout SLU because our chair is here. The council is expected to take a, uh, a vote on that tomorrow. I look forward to reporting on that matter when the commission next meets in September. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have nothing else to report unless there are any questions from commission members. Okay, thanks, Eric. Let me go to the commissioners. Uh, additional comments or questions? Uh... Commissioner Viegas has his hand raised. Sure, go ahead, Oscar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. I, I was hung up a little bit here and I got to the meeting a little late. So you may have talked about this, but I was curious if under your chair's report, there was any discussion about SB, I believe it's 185, and that's pending before the governor regarding the independent science boards, uh, the kind of the res resolution of, as we know, the independent science board's role um, and uh, the idea that, um, that that is a critical part of the review of the environmental impact report, ultimately of the conveyance project. Um, and so I just was curious if you didn't mention it, um, and I don't know if now is the right time, but at some point maybe having the, that uh, staff take a look at that legislation and whether or not we should take a, a, a at least have authorized yeah. Eric to write a letter on our behalf in, uh, indicating our support that the governor sign that bill so that there is an independent science board duly authorized to do the independent science review. No, good point, Oscar. Uh, it's Commissioner Vegas, and, and I think Eric could give an update. I, it's SB 815, I believe, and it, um, it is, I believe it's been sent to the governor under, and it has an urgency component to it and sets a rate uh, of compensation and so forth. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, you know, a reasonable thing for us to consider. It's, it, it's not agendized by certainly you know, through our staff, we could give direction. And I think it's a matter of, it, you know, is very timely. So Eric, maybe you could weigh in and to the Commissioner Villegas' uh, uh, point, but certainly to the question about um, providing appropriate support if that's uh, yeah, the, the bill number is SB 821. I just checked it. I had it wrong, so you, Oscar. <laughs> That's okay. wrong with us, Oscar. That's a lot, lot of numbers going to float around. Here. It, it, it kept getting closer to the right combination of numbers. <laughs> so it's, it's SB 821. I just checked. It's still pending in the Senate. It, it made it out of committee. Uh, uh, Commissioner Villegas described it correctly. It does establish a, a, a compensation and the fact that the board members are independent, which is important. It is an urgency measure. So if it does um, continue to make its way through the legislature and if the governor signs it, it will take effect immediately. Um, in retrospect, that probably would have been a great item to add to this agenda for a position on behalf of the commission. Um, I don't have the, uh, legislative calendar memorized off the top of my head. It could be that the governor will already, no, I don't think he will have acted by the time, necessarily by the time we meet in September. So we could certainly put it on the agenda for that meeting for a commission consideration of taking a position on that bill and be able to relay that position if it's not already law at that point. So we'll, keep, we'll continue to monitor it. And um, if it's appropriate to bring it back to the commission in September, we'll certainly do so. And my oversight completely, that would have been a great item to have on the agenda today. So let me ask, do you, um, on, on matters such as that, even if it didn't reflect, I know sometimes you're able to, you know, certainly respecting the commission's, you know, authorities and role to uh, send a letter of, of support. In this case, is that outside the, the, the scope, again, assuming the, Commission again, I don't want to too far on this and council can advise because it's not agendized, but the question was asked. And so I don't know, Eric, is that something that you have broad enough authority on or is that something when it comes to legislation that you would actually have to agendize to have us? Uh, I, I, I would tend to put that on the agenda. I always like to speak officially from the commission members in endorsing legislation. And of course we have an item on the agenda today that would just do just that for some federal legislation. Okay. But, um, <laughs> If, if Council um, Mejia would like to weigh in on this, I'd invite him to, but my, uh, 
my approach has always been for legislation before weighing in on it, unless it's a well-established position by the commission, is to bring it to the commission for specific disposition. And uh, this is uh, Deputy Attorney General Carlos Mejia, the commission's counsel. Uh, that's certainly a fine approach, and I don't think uh, there are too many legal considerations in following it. Okay. Well, I, again, I, I think to Oscar's earlier point, though, and, and I, you know, if it's an urgency measure, I don't know, you know, as it moves through the, the legislative process, but I think to be timely, and I think it's important, again, obviously, still we have to, to the commission to determine, you know, what, uh, if any position we want to take either in support of or, or, or not. Um, but again, I know we hold the alternate dates, and again, I don't want to burden people's time, but, um, you know, it, it may be that in August, you, we could have a brief meeting that can be a one, a one item agenda. And again, I don't get, get I want to be cognizant of my colleagues' time and commitments to, to this commission's work, but um, it, it, it is important. It's a, you know, I, I, would just, I would want to stress what my colleague, Mr. Viega said, and I think others know this as well, but so, I, if that's something again, I I would just put out there, Eric, that if timeliness is is a, a concern, um, you know, I guess obviously you could see if there's a you know availability, and again, I don't want to you know this takes a lot to set these meetings up, but you know to let it just pass without comment, um, you know things will still happen, but you know some, sometimes I think our our role is an important one when, when it comes to commenting on matters of, of, of that substance. So. Oscar, you want to say something? I don't know. I thought maybe Rachel well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, 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 in my experience, it just seems that we have had largely a, a, a sort of a, a position of a well-established position of the need for, and I certainly testified to this effect, and I think many of us, you have as well, Mr. Chair, the need for independent science as a central component of anything we do in the Delta relative to conveyance. And so I don't think, unless council feels otherwise, I don't think it's outside of the normal operating direction if that we would have supported something like this um, without an action. I mean, in a perfect world, yes, an action, but I'm perfectly comfortable with Eric representing what I think is sort of standard operating positions that we have taken from the last, certainly the last eight years I've been on this commission. Um, it would have not been outside of the normal path that we would proceed. I mean, this is independent science review of an environmental document, essentially dictating conveyance, seems to me straightforward and certainly consistent within what we've always been operating in, so. Other thoughts, commissioners and, and again, uh, council, uh, Mr. Media, any, maybe look for a little guidance here um, on whether, obviously Eric, as to where he would prefer, but is it appropriate? And again, I don't want to get a scans on the agenda here, but. Um... Uh, Chair Natoli, this is yes. uh, Carlos Mejia again. Yeah, Carlos. Uh, it's certainly appropriate for the executive director to send a letter on the commission's behalf. Uh, I might suggest uh, that the executive director indicate perhaps that uh, the letter has not been formally approved by the council uh, or excuse me, by the commission in a vote on a notice agenda item, uh, but certainly he, he's well within his uh, authority to uh, send a letter on the commission's behalf with those caveats. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Eric, you're comfortable with that then? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, 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 actually, what, what I would prefer to do is, um, and we can have further discussion now. I, I'd prefer to confer with the chair. I, truthfully, I would be more comfortable even if there were a very brief special meeting and it's, don't worry about the effort on our part. It's really just a question of whether we can convene enough commissioners to make it happen. But I, 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 I really would favor a formal weigh in by the commission. Of, I mean, a letter that says, I'm sending this from the commission, but the commission didn't take an action on this. Um, I don't know. I'm just, it, it doesn't, doesn't feel, like, it doesn't feel like a good approach to me. And, um, okay. And, and so, um, all right. That, that, that's right. Commissioner Vasquez, did you want to? No, I was going to say it doesn't have much meaning. Okay. Back in so, the commission. So, 
All right. Well, again, if commissioners are, are, are again, irrespective of what the position might be on this, are, are willing, again, recognizing availability might be um, a little um, challenged. Uh, I don't think we have to wait until our, we can call a special meeting. There's a process for doing that. We could do it with a one item and, you know, try to hold ourselves to 10 or 15 minutes, uh, certainly allowing for any public comment. But um, I, I guess that's the route. And again, I, you know, as chair, I certainly would make myself available and, and uh, would hope my fellow commissioners, unless there's any strong objections to that, I think it's important enough. So Commissioner Steele, did you want to weigh in? Why did you punch it up? You're on mute, Paul. Yes, I wanted to say that, uh, why don't we just take care of that now? Why do we have to have a special meeting? We're all here right now. I don't, I don't think it's properly agendized, Paul. That's the only thing. If we're going to take a formal action, it needs to be, it needs to be a certain notice, uh, as much as we might like to. I, again, uh, uh, Carlos, um, he, our uh, council could advise us, but I think that would probably be stretching it quite a bit. So, uh, uh, Chair and Tully, this is Carlos Mejia again. I, I would concur with your assessment. Okay. Okay. Again, just trying to save time on this. It doesn't seem like a really big issue. But if you do it that way, I'm available. Okay, thanks, Paul. Other commissioners, uh, let me. I want to make sure you're included in the conversation here. Anybody else want to weigh in? Uh, I'll yes. weigh in, Commissioner Fuller. Yes. Um, yes. I've had my hand up for a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, George. I didn't. I, I, I got Stacy has to let me know. So okay. No, yeah, no. And actually, I'm so sorry, but Commissioner Bush has had his hand up for a very long. Oh, time. okay. All right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we had Commissioner Fuller. He's punched in. I mean, and and, and uh, Commissioner Bush calling him. I'm. I apologize. So interrupt me, Stacy. If I can okay. Call you, so. I will. All right. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, and Commissioner Bush afterwards. But I I agree with uh, uh, Chairman Vint, the Director Vint, as to holding on to it. Uh, it needs to be agendized. You're talking about a letter involving science. Uh, the public needs to look at it. The scientific community needs to look at it. We need to weigh in on it and have a, a debate. Uh, we're not just sending up something we already done once come up and I'm not criticizing or doing anything else, but I don't want us to get a rec uh, reputation of just sending things up. Oops, well, we haven't looked at it yet and approved it, but this is, this is our position and I would much rather be formally even coming back to a special meeting and sitting down and, and discussing it and make sure that uh, uh, people who may have a uh, intense interest in the science had a chance to weigh in. So, thank you, George. Commissioner Fuller, thank you very much for your comments. Okay, Commissioner Bush. Yeah, I didn't have my hand up on this. It was for something else. So, okay. you can come back to me. But on this specific one, I think that's the process. I mean, it, it, it has to go through a certain process. I understand the difficulties with, um, you know, stuff that's going to be changing constantly, but maybe we can set a general path an outline for Eric on what to do and then you know he can act independent of that but I agree that it, it needs to be kind of follow the process. Okay thanks Brian and the dog votes yes too so okay. <laughs> he agreed. Okay other commissioners Stacy anyone else got their hand up? No. Any objections then to a, it'll be a special meeting we'll attempt to hold it briefly and uh, I think we have a process for determining obviously it'll be done with the due, due legal notice and so forth and um, but it would certainly be in advance of our regular scheduled September day. We do, we actually hold dates on the alternate months. So that may be as soon as we can get back to this, but if, if not, uh, maybe a way to, again, the time that fits uh, on a, a day and, 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 uh, and time where we can duly notice it and allow for the uh, discussion and deliberation that may go, go into this. So, all right, if nothing else on that, then we will, um, uh, we got guidance to the executive director and staff to um, work with uh, council and with um, commission members regarding scheduling and appropriate notice and, and so forth and uh, see if we can get that back to us under a guise of a special meeting if possible for that one item. Okay. All right. Uh, and then, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, Commissioner Bush wanted to say anything on the other topic. Right. Okay. Yeah. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up. Eric wanted me to comment a little bit on the 12 million for the abandoned vessels. So um, that's something we've kind of been working on for quite a while as staff. We produced a, a, a report on abandoned commercial vessels a couple of years ago. 
Um, there was some legislation to kind of research and look at that. Um, Assembly member uh, Fraser has been kind of at the forefront of this and I have no idea, I'll just be upfront on the, uh, what actually was the magic button to get that in. We weren't really on the front lines kind of doing that, but somehow it got in maybe because the governor was previously part of our commission and knew our desire for that or I have no idea, but we're happy to have it. Um, we actually haven't met internally about it. We're waiting for it to, you know, be formally approved in the budget, which just happened. So we're meeting next week internally, and I'll keep Eric posted and in touch with that and report back accordingly. But. Great. Good. Well, thanks for again, and and I would just echo the thanks, uh, Commissioner Bush, to to you and agency you represent have for a number of years on the commission, but state lands uh, have provided the you know the support, uh, personnel support, and so forth for a number of years. Uh, Think going back to the early days of the formation of the commission back in the 90s and so and did, did a lot of uh, a lot of work uh, behind the scenes but uh, very important for the staffing and other uh, elements that, that go with the agency. thanks to the state lands commission and for your leadership as well and excited about the 12 million uh, again you know as you said we had the report that uh, the, the list was long and, and and very daunting but i know there was good work done identifying some of the you know the uh, worst of the worst as related to some of the vessels and, you know, the, the hazards they po pose to, uh, you know, Delta environs, let alone the waterways and, you know, the active use out there. So we'll look forward to it. And again, if it's a, <clears throat> appropriate to, <clears throat> as that <clears throat> word comes down and how you might administer that and so forth, uh, certainly schedule time for you or, you know, your colleagues in the agency to, you know, give us a, a more in-depth report uh, behind that. So, and talk about how we go about being partners in our, because I know counties are, Certainly, you know, have, have stepped up working through the waterways grants through uh, boating waterways and, uh, you know, through our respective law enforcement as well as other, you know, code enforcement agencies. So I think there'd be a great interest in seeing how we might maximize what we're already doing uh, commensurate with what this opportunity presents. Yeah, yeah, we work cooperatively with a lot of the sheriff's departments and trying we to do, do stuff and hope and even um, the U.S. Army Corps and other people, uh, U.S. Coast Guard. But um, hopefully we can... Uh, clean the waterways up in the Delta a little bit more and get more navigability and get some of that junk out of there with this. Looking Great. forward to it. Good, thanks, Brian. Eric, did you want to weigh in? No, okay. we'll look forward to, uh, as more information develops, to briefing the commission. And okay. Mr. Chair, I, I do note that during this uh, executive director report, Vice Chair Wynn did join the meeting, so welcome to him. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon, Chuck. Um, all right, any other commissioner uh, on the executive director's report? If not, I'll turn to the public and see if we have any comments uh, by the uh, members of the public. Stacy? There are no commissioner hands raised. And maybe give them a moment, but I do not see any members of the public raising their hand either. Okay. All righty. And then if there's. Um, Nothing further before I leave this item. Did was Commissioner Nakanishi able to get in so he could register vote on the previous item? Do you know? He, Commissioner Nakanishi, are you able to address the commission by unmuting yourself? I see that he's. Yes, Commissioner Nakanishi. Hi, Alan. Are you there? I think we're having some technical difficulties still. We, we can hear his background noise. Commissioner Nakanishi? We will have additional votes, so it would be great if. But uh, it worked that out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just holding. I was holding that one item up, but we will have additional votes. So, okay, if we can keep working with uh, Mr. Commissioner Nishi to assist him if we can on our end to be able to um, connect, uh, you know, the audio. All right. Um, if there's nothing further than the item, then let's keep moving down. And thanks for the good discussion and the reports. So that takes us to um, <clears throat> item eight, which is our. DPAC report, and uh, uh, we will have uh, Mark Bruner, uh, 
as we have in the past, give us a report from their June 29th meeting and any other items. And I'll turn to uh, Mr. Printer, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Yes, DPAC met on June 29 uh, for normal, uh, in this case, nearly two hour meeting. Um, we welcome three new members that were appointed by the um, commission. Robin Brown, who owns a business in Ride, Morris Lum with the Sacramento Yacht Club, Club and uh, DeWitt Zelke of the Nature Conservancy. So um, uh, great new members. Thank you for, thank you for um, adding those folks to uh, your advisory committee. Um, as you can see from the note, we took, uh, received a number of reports. The most important, I think, was Eric's discussion and presentation of the updates to the draft of Vision 2030. Um, and there were detailed comments. Um, and if, if it's if it's permissible by the chair, I wanted to report or vote in uh, in support of the um, staff's revised report was unanimous. Um, I know that's item 11, um, but that was an action that we took. That was our, our primary uh, action by vote. Uh, with regard to future meetings, we had a discussion trying to uh, explore ways with Eric, whether we can, um, when, when we come out of COVID, try to maintain the advantage of allowing folks to participate um, remotely in our meetings um, and then and then still have in-person meetings. I think that's those are hybrid meetings. Various people are trying to make that happen. <clears throat> and Eric was um, good to be supportive of that. And I, I know he'll be exploring uh, whether we can make that happen in the future in, in uh, the hybrid form. So we are looking to the future um, in that regard. And those are the highlights of my report, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for the, the work of the uh, <clears throat> commission and uh, for your deliberations and, uh, and ongoing work. And we, we too welcome your, your new members. Um, so let me ask the members of the uh, commission, any questions or comments for Mr. Pritchard? There are no hands raised. Okay, and how about any public comment? And there are no public comments either. All right, well, very good, very concise. Thanks again, Mark, for your leadership as well. And uh, we'll uh, probably hear from you later in the agenda as well. So, okay, very good. So if nothing else Thank on that you. item, let's uh, move, move down to item nine, which is, um, Receipt of an update on the Delta National Heritage Area and uh, consideration of um, legislation that's pending uh, the bills called out on the agenda, HR 4D87 and HR 1230. And uh, I understand uh, Blake Roberts will make the presentation on this. Eric, anything you wanted to introduce it with? No, let's let Blake take it away. Okay, Thank you, good. Sir. You bet. Thank you. Well, good evening, Chair Natoli and members of the commission. My name is Blake Roberts and I am a program manager one with the commission and coordinator for the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta National Heritage Area. Uh, today, I will be, be providing you an update on the National Heritage Area Program and ask for a commission action on a letter of support for two congressional bills that affect the Delta National Heritage Area. Since our last update, the National Heritage Area Management Plan Advisory Committee held meetings on May 6th and July 1st. Commission staff, the Point Heritage Development Consulting Team, and California State Park staff presented to the advisory committee on several items, including the management plan schedule, branding and website, partnership plan, vision for the National Heritage Area and federal funding. We have held at least one meeting each with, the three of, uh, with three of the four task groups, which serve as subcommittees for the full advisory committee. We are planning two public meetings on Monday, August 30th and Wednesday, September 1st. More information about those meetings will be forthcoming. Our next advisory committee meeting will be on Thursday, September 9th. The action item before you involves a letter of support for two pieces of legislation introduced by Congressman John Garamendi. The first is HR 4087, which would extend the deadline for new national heritage areas to submit management plans to the Secretary of Interior by one year. The current deadline is March, 2022. The revised deadline would be March, 2023. Extending the deadline would allow us to increase public engagement, improve our tribal consultation process, and permit our consultants to conduct necessary field work. The second piece of legislation is HR 1230, 
which would adjust the National Heritage Area boundary to include an additional 62 acres within the city of Rio Vista, which comprises the decommissioned US Army Reserve Center, US Car Coast Guard Station, Wastewater Treatment Plant, and Sandy Beach County Park. Congressman Garamendi introduced this bill at the request of the city of Rio Vista. The boundary adjustment was incorporated into another bill, HR 803, which passed the House of Representatives on February 26th. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your consideration of the, of the letters. Thanks, Blake. Okay, commission members, questions? There are no hands. Okay. All right, members of the public, any statements? And still no hands. Oh, we do have, uh, now we have two, uh, first Commissioner Fuller and then Commissioner Vogel. Okay, Commissioner Fuller. Thank you, let me get out of here. Uh, George, you're on mute, you're muted. There you go. These days I'll learn it, I'll learn it, <laughs> right. Up in Sacramento maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. Anyway, but back to where we were. Uh, what did the army base do? I mean, that's the biggest thing. I don't really know what the mar what the why is why is it so historic over there in Rio Vista versus another army base that that exists like Sacramento or San Francisco. Uh, from what I understand, the Army base was involved with some of the levy work that happened in the Delta. So even though it was an Army base, I think it was uh, had a lot of uh, involvement of the Army Corps of Engineers. So uh, it was really uh, very instrumental in terms of uh, supporting the, the levy work that's happened in the Delta. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Vogel. Thank you, Chair Natoli. I just wondered if there had been any organization to express any opposition to this federal legislation, and I wonder if staff feels that there are any implications to the na na uh, National Heritage Area one way or the other for, for the effort. I'll answer that, Commissioner Vogel. We're aware of no opposition. Um, certainly to the addition of Rio Vista that's supported by the city of Rio Vista. Uh, the extension of the management plan deadlines, uh, our fellow class of 2019, uh, the other national heritage areas that were established in the legislation that year are working with their congressional representatives to uh, advance this bill because they would like the additional year to complete their efforts as well. So really no opposition that we're aware of and both efforts are um, pretty non-controversial in nature. Thank you. <laughs> what other questions? Commissioner Fuller has his hand raised. Okay, good. George, back to you. Yes, we just one more question. I noticed on there is the National Park Service uh, a map and diagram as such. Is this going to it's going to come under the National Park Service and be the type where you interview and live in the area and that that uh, op type of operation, the National okay. Park. Yeah, Commissioner Fuller, the, the Park Service administers the National Heritage Area Program, but National Heritage Areas are not national parks. There's no land use control uh, that the Park Service exerts. They're really just the administrative entity to organize these uh, 55 national heritage areas throughout the country. Thank you. <laughs> That's an important point. Good question, George, but certainly in the early years going back probably almost a decade from when discussing this, that was an important consideration uh, of folks about, you know, what were the implications, uh, you know, of, of National Park Service. And I think as Eric accurately pointed out that there's no, no land use authority and basically it's a locally developed plan. Uh, and uh, therefore the role of the commission working with uh, other, uh, you know, pertinent parties in the, in the Delta. So good question though. Okay, anybody? Else, uh, any questions about what we asked? This is an action item, so if there's any questions or concerns, now's, now's the time. There's no hands raised. All right, so we do have a recommendation, and so the chair would entertain a uh, <clears throat> motion and a second as appropriate. 
I'll, I'll move I'll, it. Uh, second, Viegas. Okay, so moved by Fuller, seconded by Viegas to uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> offer letter of support for the uh, legislation as, I, as, as reported on. Further comments, then uh, the clerk to call the roll, please. Daisy. Thank you. Chair Natoli. Aye. Vice Chair Wynn. Yes. Commissioner Viegas. Yes. Commissioner Vasquez. Yes. Commissioner Fuller. Aye. Commissioner Steele. Aye. Commissioner Nakanishi, have you been able to join audio? Yes, yes I'm okay. audio. Thank you. Thank okay, you. great. And, and do I have a, was that a yes vote as well? Commissioner Nakanishi, can you share your vote just for clarity? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Paroli? Aye. Commissioner Slater? Aye. Commissioner Agar? Aye. Commissioner Eddy? Aye. Commissioner Vogel? Aye. Commissioner Bush? Aye. Thank you. Chair Natoli, that is 13 yeses and zero noes and zero abstentions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy. Thank you, Commission members. And with that, then we'll keep moving down the agenda. Item number 10, which is Receipt of an update on the Delta Levy Investment Strategy uh, draft language and uh, consideration of the Commission's uh, letter of support uh, that uh, will be outlined in, in Eric's report. So, with that, Eric, I'll turn to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commission members. Uh, the Delta Levy Investment Strategy, or what I'll call D List for short, is an effort that's been underway at the Delta Stewardship Council since 2014. It's intended to um, implement uh, the statutory language that directs the council to uh, create a prior prioritization scheme for levy work in the Delta. Um, the Stewardship Council uh, amended chapter seven of the Delta plan. That's where this work uh, is highlighted. They amended it in 2018 to implement their program, which, which was a, is a prioritization at that time was a prioritization scheme. And it actually included tiers that named specific Delta Islands and tracks. And so uh, you literally were in a tier, either the highest tier, the second tier or the third tier. Um, after the council adopted that prioritization uh, scheme in 2018, they rescinded that action and reverted to the previous policy in 2020 to allow the council staff to incorporate new elevation imaging data, what we call LIDAR data that was completed by the Department of Water Resources. That work is largely complete and the uh, council staff expect to propose both revised tiers and request approval to proceed with rulemaking at the August 2021 Stewardship Council meeting. Now, the reason I've put this on the agenda is that the commission has weighed in on several occasions, including a 2017 letter from commission members that argued for improvement of all Delta levies to a base standard a 2019 letter from your executive director, from myself, expressing concern over the definitions of levy rehabilitation in particular, and specifically that levy rehabilitation would be subject to prioritization under DLIS, even though it was funded by the levy subventions program. Uh, and I think that's an important distinction because our understanding throughout the Stewardship Council's deliberations on DLIS has been that they would not subject levy subventions efforts to the prioritization scheme. And that's really why I have uh, proposed this item on the agenda and have the 
proposed draft letter to Stewardship Council Chair Tatayan and members that I'm asking the Commission's approval of this afternoon. So that the Commission uh, by action of Commission members can be on record with the uh, view that levy rehabilitation, which um, at the risk of simplifying levy rehabilitation, let's just say it's repairing a levy that has been damaged or even including a breaching of a levy. And I know there are uh, stewardship council staff members on the meeting and I would uh, welcome them to correct me if I stated that incorrectly. That levy rehabilitation should be considered part of levy operation and maintenance such as is funded by the levy subvention program and not part of what is called in the definitions levy improvement, which would be subject to the prioritization scheme. And I keep saying subject to the prioritization scheme. I, I hope I've been clear, but maybe I haven't. That means that the Stewardship Council's um, uh, directive is that you improve levies in the first tier before you move to subsequent lower tiers uh, for the uh, expenditures of money to improve Delta levies. It's not an absolute requirement that that take place. There's the ability for DWR who administers these levy programs to argue for why they deviated from that levy prioritization and present that rationale to the council. But the intention is you prioritize tier A before you prioritize tier B before you prioritize tier C. So I hope that wasn't too convoluted. That all leads to the draft letter that is in the commission meeting packet that I request your approval of that if approved by the commission would be transmitted to the stewardship council. Importantly for this meeting that it's transmitted in advance to the council taking up that matter at their August meeting and providing direction uh, to their staff on how to proceed with uh, presumably taking that out for public review and comment. So that's the request, Mr. Chair, and uh, hopefully uh, background that uh, uh, is sufficient to uh, aid the understanding of this item. Okay, thank you, Eric. So let me uh, turn to commission members first, and then we may have other members of public and or um, other parties who want to weigh in on this. Um, so commission members, uh, questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Slater has his hand raised. Sure, Tom. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think uh, Eric did a very good job of explaining that. But in a nutshell, the RDs and the the LMAs, the levy maintenance areas, agencies, certainly within North Delta, and I suspect all the way up and down the Delta, don't want to be precluded from from doing those repairs because of the clause in the DSL, uh, whatever that acronym is, the investment strategy so so i think that's eric is that the crux of the situation that that we just want the language i don't think we have arguments or disagreements with the stewardship council or we can we can address those later on but that is what the lmas and rds are concerned about is the inability to function under the subvention program because of this language and um yeah, well is that that how you get it eric yeah, it really gets to whether there's uh, funding support for those actions. So th there's nothing that says a reclamation district acting entirely on its own could not proceed. It's just, it has to do with funding um, from the DWR levy programs. That, so, and and I, I just didn't include that, yes. To, so yeah. that we can uh, utilize the subvention program like we've been doing which is funding. And it's been an outstanding program and one that has saved our lives and we continue to, to uh, ask for support for that. Thanks, Commissioner Slater. Appreciate the comment. Okay, others. I do not see any other commissioners with their raised hands, but I do have Melinda Terry raising her hand. Okay, all right, there's no other commission members. We certainly come back to commission before we 
take us up for a vote, but uh, we, that will go to members of the public and other interested parties. So to uh, Linda. Hello. Hey. I just wanted to uh, thank the commission for uh, staying focused on this topic and uh, say that we support the letter and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. <clears throat> Clerk, any other hands? Yes, we have Erin Mullen. Erin. Hi, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Erin Mullen and I am a senior engineer with the Delta Stewardship Council. And I am the um, primary uh, person who's been working on the D-list. And first off, I would like to uh, send, extend my appreciation to Eric for giving me the heads up um, about this being on your agenda today. So um, I appreciate your collaboration and reaching out and letting me know that this was gonna be on this was going to be a, a topic. Um, I, it is definitely the council's intent to, 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 I'm trying to think of the way to word this. You know, when, there was a lot of discussion about rehabilitation when we went, when we went through the rulemaking process the first time around, and it seemed that it just ended up becoming more of a confusing issue as opposed to a clarifying one. And so in this process, in this second time around, we've actually removed the phrase rehabilitation from the, pri from the prioritization. So just, just the, the activities that are outlined that are subject to the prioritization does not include rehabilitation. We have excluded operations and maintenance and rehabilitation from that list of activities that needs to be addressed. And it's becoming, you know, as we, as we go through this process, it's becoming apparent that our intent is, um, we're still struggling to get our intent across. So obviously we have more work to do with our stakeholders and we will be continuing to reach out to them and meeting with them. And um, I just wanted to make myself available for questions if you had any. Well, well thank you, Erin. And thanks, thanks for uh, certainly commenting and appreciate you know, your work. Uh, acknowledging uh, Eric reaching out to you. Maybe I could just ask you, so by being silent and not <clears throat> excluding, you, is it your opinion or staff's opinion that that addresses the issue as you've heard it presented here today. And I would certainly, I'd ask the same of Eric, but uh, it sounds to me like that, that uh, by making no specific reference, then there's some presumption that things are, you know, retained going back to Commissioner Slater's point that, you know, I, know, I say business as usual, but that that program that is uh, so integral to, um, you know, levy rehabilitation and work that goes on in the Delta with our reclamation districts and other uh, you know, other, other parties, but certainly the RDs. <clears throat> so I guess I'd be curious to, to, you know, if you could just elaborate briefly on what you think by leaving it out as part of the, you know, recirculation of this. And I'd like to hear Eric's comment on that as well. Of course, actually, thank you for, yeah. um, thank you for getting the opportunity to clarify on that. When I said, I, I guess I should back up a little bit when I said I let leaving it out, um, it, when we, what we left out was a, was a definition of rehabilitation. We had, um, that was one of the proposed definitions that we were going to add to our glossary. And in the second process, we have removed that. And that was, that, that was work, that was part of work that we had done with the flood, with the flood protection board and DWR and trying to align our definitions with theirs and their stance on OMRRNR and what that meant in relationship to um, their obligations with the flood board. So, um, you know, one of the things that this regulation needs to do is it needs to be able to kind of straddle both of the project and the non-project um, funding systems. So that makes it a little bit tricky because the regulations and the rules that govern each of those systems are so different. And the state's interest and responsibility in both of those systems is very different. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that we, um, I know that there's been some 
there's been some distress that we have not specifically left out the program, the subventions program, but it's been our intent with the way that we wrote the legislation or the, the draft regulation, I should say, is that <clears throat> we are speaking to activities and not programs. Since program names can change, um, programs can, new programs can arise, programs can go away. I understand that subventions is in statute and it's unlikely to go away anytime soon, but we wanted to make sure that our uh, draft regulation was clear and um, and it addressed all of the potential activities that could be happening in the Delta, whether it happened under special projects or under subventions or a new program that uh, DWR's flood management develops that is you know, maybe particular to the project levies. So that is why we do not speak specifically to subventions. Um, in the draft proposed language, we do specifically state that operations and maintenance is important and it should continue and through, throughout the Delta. Um, and I, I don't have it, the language right here in front of me, but um, I could email it to, I can email it to Stacy and she could get it to the, get it to the commission. But it was part of our May, um, it was part of the, um, the May staff report that we took to the council. So it is, it's, it is public knowledge. Um, and so I, it, we, like I said, obviously, you know, we, we still, if there's still concerns out there. We still have work to do by, um, to help people understand that it's not our intention to get in the way of operations and maintenance and rehabilitation with this work. So, um, it's, it's just going to have to, we're just going to continue to have to have this conversation and, and do the outreach. So I hope that is clarifying. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Eric, did you want to respond? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate uh, what Aaron said. Uh, for commissioners uh, reviewing this letter, um, I'll draw your attention to a sentence and I'll read it out. It's in the third paragraph of the letter and it's really the crux of the letter. It's toward the end of that large paragraph. It's the third paragraph. And here goes, as proposed in the staff draft regulations, meaning the council staff's draft regulations from January, 2021, certain levy rehabilitation activities presently funded by the subventions program would be subject to prioritization under <laughs> Delta plan policy RRP1. So I appreciate what Aaron said, but the current definition in those staff draft regulations is far too narrowly drawn and overly restrictive. And truthfully, it's not consistent with the discussions we heard occurring at the council throughout the preparation of the D list, which was subventions program is not gonna be subject to the prioritization scheme. And unfortunately this would subject parts of the subventions program to the prioritization scheme by creating a very narrow definition of levy operation and maintenance. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, other commission members? You know, Commissioner Villegas, I know you were on the council at the time this was first circulated and certainly I know it's tracked it. Anything you wanted to add? Yeah, no, Eric's absolutely right. We, we need to absolutely make sure that this prioritization scheme does not interfere with in any way the, the subvention. I know it can't control it, but we, we need to do our job in ensuring that we're putting on the table every concern that we have so that it doesn't interfere with or morph into chipping away at limited funding for the districts to maintain the levies the way that they always have. We know they can leverage you know, a dollar into a hundred dollars doing what they do. And they do that very well. There's no question about that. So I, I don't think that's the intent of this promulgation process, but we just need to continue to make sure that we're doing, as Aaron said, kind of continue to have this conversation because that's just, it's not, it's not negotiable from our perspective. That's just, it's too precious uh, in terms of levy protection. Okay, great. Thanks, Oscar. Other commissioners? We don't have any commissioner hands raised, but we do have Gilbert Cozio. Sure. Okay. Go to Mr. Cozio. Gilbert. Uh, thanks you. Uh, thank you, Chair Natoli and the members of the uh, commission. I just want to add a couple of things. Um, so Aaron, Aaron's correct. You know, that was the intent, and then in the last rulemaking made it real clear that 
the in intent was not to hinder the subventions program. What's forgotten is that embedded in that subventions program is the um, is water code section 12981, which states that the, the Delta should stay in the same configuration it is. That means all the islands up, you know, trying to keep as many levees up as we can. And also embedded in that is implementation of at one point was called the Delta plan and that's bulletin 19282. Uh, when, when the legislation was drafted for the Svenges, that was the intent that we had a plan. Um, it, was, it was a joint plan between the Corps of Engineers and the Department of Water Resources. Unfortunately, the, during the latter stages of uh, development of that plan, and, it, and, and they studied it for about 10 years, it was a very good process. The Corps of Engineers decided there was no federal interest. <clears throat> and so towards the end of Bulletin 19282, DWR um, finished up their plan and they were really adamant that the Corps had all sorts of options about saving certain islands and putting polders in and saving other islands. And DWR and Director Roby at the time was really adamant, no, we're trying to implement Water Code Section 12981. In fact, you can look at Bulletin 19282 and you'll see that there are letters from Director Roby to um, the federal government saying, we've got to keep these things up because of the interconnection of all the levees and you can't have one levee failure pulling a piece out of the puzzle. It'll, it'll kind of ruin the whole house of cards there. So um, in what I'm saying is embedded in that um, subventions program is a little more than people think. And that's what we're trying to get across that we're just trying to implement what we were told to do um, in 1982, you know, 13 months before I started, we had this great plan. So when I started, I'm thinking, all right, my career, I'm gonna solve the Delta and uh, <laughs> fix these levees. And here I am 63 years old and I haven't done it yet. So let's see, but that, that's what's happening is that there's more embedded into what we call Delta levee subventions than, than the very basic spraying and grading of levees, graveling, that sort of thing. It involves trying to reach our goal, the intended goal of the state uh, of, of Water Code 12981 and Wilson 9282. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Thanks for that background. It's important. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, any other members? If not, I'm going to bring back Commissioner Lynn for. No, there are no hands raised. Okay. Thank you, uh, Melinda and uh, Gil, both of your comments. So I'll bring it back to the Commission. We have a uh, the uh, staff recommendation before us with the letter we've had a discussion um, heard from uh, Ms. Mall on behalf of the Stewardship Council as well. So, uh, what's the pleasure of the? Um, of the uh, I'd move the item as recommended by staff, Viegas. We have a motion by Viegas. We have a second. Uh, Commissioner Slater, second. Okay, and second by Commissioner Slater. Right, and we have the draft language uh, before us. And if there's no suggestion modifications, we're going to uh, take a motion. Uh, <clears throat> we have a motion to approve the letter as, uh, as presented uh, uh, to the Stewardship Council. Here, and then we'll... all right. Uh, anything further? Any hands? Last minute hands? Madam Clerk? No hands. Okay, then I'll ask you to call the roll, please. Okay, Chair Natoli. Aye. Vice Chair Wynn. Vice Chair Wynn, you may need to unmute. Okay, I'll come, oh, I'll come back. Commissioner Villegas? Yes. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Aye. Commissioner Steele? Aye. Commissioner Nakanishi? Yes. Commissioner Paroli? Aye. Commissioner Slater? Aye. Commissioner Agar? I'm going to abstain from this. Commissioner Eddy? Abstain. Commissioner Vogel? Abstain. Commissioner Bush? Aye. And coming back around to Vice Chair Wynn? Yes, I found my cursor. Thank you. 
Okay, Chair Natoli, we have 10 yeses and three abstains. Very good. All right, thank you, Commission members. And uh, so noted, uh, transmitted, and uh, thanks for the engagement and discussion. So, nothing further on item. Let's move to next item, item 11, which is uh, you and any revisions to the Vision 2030 Commission Strategic Plan and Objectives. And this was uh, prepared by Mr. Bank, and I don't know if uh, he's going to be the presenter, but. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you, and Commission members. Um, Vision 2030 is the Commission's strategic plan. It was adopted by the Commission in May of 2015. In November of 2020, the Commission staff undertook a review of Vision 2030. We had discussions with the Delta Protection Advisory Committee, and we sought comments from Delta stakeholders. Uh, based on that review, we decided that the only thing that really needed uh, re revisiting in Vision 2030 were the strategic objectives, the mission statement, the vision statement, all the background information still was relevant. But uh, the strategic objectives, because some of them had been accomplished, some of them we felt maybe were not rising to the level of truly strategic. There were items that we identified that had not been part of the discussion in 2015. So we undertook a revision, a proposed revision of the strategic objectives. We had subsequent opportunities to visit with the Delta Protection Advisory Committee on those. We put them out to interested parties in the Delta. We did receive a few comments, very minimal. Uh, most of our discussion was with the advisory committee. Uh, again, there's really three categories of proposed changes in the strategic objectives. And those strategic objectives are attached to strategic themes in our uh, Vision 2030 document. So the three categories of proposed changes are, number one, removing strategic, strategic objectives that have been accomplished. <clears throat> And this includes the National Heritage Area designation and permanent status for Delta levy subventions or strategic objectives that are no longer considered strategic. And I tried to indicate as such in the margin notes, it, <coughs> excuse me, in the document that's included in the commission meeting packet. The second category are adding new strategic objectives. And this includes broadband and cellular service improvements, subsidence reversal through promotion of specific crops and supporting sediment management among other examples. The third category is just to revise the existing objectives for clarity and removing duplication in the document. The Delta Protection Advisory Committee supported modest changes to the strategic objectives. They voted unanimously to approve them there was one change that uh, I did not accept in the final version. It was discussed by the Delta Protection Advisory Committee. It was part of a comment that uh, Russ Ryan, who represents Metropolitan Water District and also represents uh, Delta Water Exporters on our Delta Protection Advisory Committee, a comment that he had made, which I felt had already been addressed elsewhere in the uh, strategic objectives under water. And it, it had specifically to do with uh, acknowledging water supply reliability, which we absolutely do acknowledge that water supply reliability is a co-equal goal for the Delta. Um, going back to our economic sustainability plan for the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, we argue that the way to accomplish water supply right, reliability is through improving Delta levees and retaining through Delta conveyance instead of isolated conveyance, which would be what a Delta tunnels or Delta tunnel project would provide. So no changes there, um, but I did want to acknowledge that specifically uh, that as being part of our discussion, but uh, feel that it's already covered in those water objectives uh, elsewhere. And that uh, Mr. Chair is the background I wanted to provide um, I'm asking for the commission's support for these revised strategic objectives. Those form the basis of the commission staff's implementation plan and the individual work plans. So we're always very keen to have um, 
the most updated strategic direction from the council. And I ask for the, uh, from the commission, I should say, excuse me, I've been talking about the council a lot today from the commission and ask for the commission's approval of that. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate your, your continuing an update of this, and it is up for action on force. I want to once again thank the DPAC for their engagement. I know that they've had this before them on numerous occasions over the last year or so. So, okay, let me turn to commission members first. Uh, you have the uh, uh, body of information before you, and if there's any questions or comments, um, now is the time. Weigh in. There are no hands raised. Okay, no hands. So let me turn members of the public, Stacy. And no hands raised there either. All righty. So with that, I'm bringing it back to the commission. <clears throat> again, if there's no further, you know, no comments or any questions, but we do have the recommendation before us. And again, a motion would be in order. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Slater will move for approval. Commissioner Steele will second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Slater, second by Commissioner Steele to the staff recommendation uh, with the Vision 2030 strategic objectives uh, and, as outlined in the document. And if there's nothing further, uh, then I'll call for the vote. Thank you. Chair Natoli. Aye. Vice Chair Wynn? Yes. Commissioner Viegas? Yes. Commissioner Vasquez? Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Aye. Commissioner Steele? Aye. Commissioner Nakanishi? Aye, yes. Commissioner Paroli? Aye. Commissioner Slater? Aye. Commissioner Agar? Aye. Commissioner Eddy? Aye. Commissioner Vogel? Abstain. Commissioner Bush? Aye. Chair Natoli, we have 12 yeses and one abstain. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Commission members, and thank you, Madam Clerk. So, with that, uh, we'll then continue to move down to our agenda. Now we have uh, item 12, proceed to report on the Yolo Bypass Salmonid uh, Habitat Restoration and Fish Passage Project, and also then discussion regarding Commission position on. Uh, potential or proposed use of eminent domain to acquire interest in the land for Delta habitat restoration. And I believe uh, uh, this is gonna be a <clears throat> introduced uh, by Eric and then a presentation by our program manager, uh, Mr. James Newcomb. So Eric, any opening comments? Yeah, Mr. Chair, no, I, I, I welcome uh, uh, James Newcomb to present. I will follow that up with the specific uh, recommendation I'm making to the commission, but he, he will be providing the background on the project. Okay, very good. All right, James, Mr. Newcomb, we'll turn to you. Yeah, thank you. Just one order of business. Um, am I going to have presenter privileges to be able to share a map with you all? Yeah, please. Uh, we, let's, uh, whoever can do that for James, please uh, open it up for him. No, it's not the chair. <laughs> I lose the graphics right now. Yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get that pulled up, James. If uh, well, actually, we'll we'll let um, yeah, Justin or Stacy just let him know when he should be able to do that. Okay. Well, first off, uh, thank you, Mr. Bink, for the invitation to present, and also thank you, uh, Delta Protection Commission, for the time. My name is James Newcomb. I'm an environmental program manager that manages riverine restoration actions for the State Water Project for Department of Water Resources. I'm here today to provide a cursory overview of our project purpose, the project development, and our easement needs. Um, our project has a long history. 12 minutes isn't, isn't really ample time to go into great detail in the background of our project, but DWR is happy to come back in the future if, if the desire is there. So just hey, getting- 
Yeah. You can bring up your PowerPoint now. Okay. All right, I'm getting an indication that you can see it now. Oh, no, not yet. How's that? There it is, we got it. Okay. So it's, it's just the one slide here. Um, and really I'm gonna reference just sort of for, for location, what we're talking about. But um, the project I'm here representing and the purpose of the Yolo Bypass, a monitored habitat restoration and fish passage project, which has a really long name. So we also call it the Big Notch Project is intended to deliver significant biological benefits to federally and state protected salmon, steelhead, and sturgeon. Uh, those benefits are achieved by allowing more flow from the Sacramento River. So I'm not sure if my cursor is kind of showing up here, but yes. allowing more flow from the Sacramento River through our future headwork structure that's going to be placed at the east end of Fremont Weir. And uh, essentially that headwork structure will allow more water to come off the Sacramento River and bring in juvenile fish from the river and out onto the floodplains and the Yolo Bypass. And then that same structure is used to provide adult fish a way to get out of the Yolo Bypass and back into the Sacramento River. DWR and Bureau of Reclamation are required to do this project by the California Endangered Species Act and the Federal Endangered Species Act. And that's because of the operation of the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. Just simply put, it's a, it's a federal state requirement for DWR and Reclamation to be able to continue delivering water to over 30 million Californians and irrigating over a third of the state's agricultural lands. The project itself has a high standard to deliver significant biological benefits, but throughout its history, our goal has always been to minimize the land use impacts while maximizing those biological benefits. The, the land uses that are primary to our focus are, are flood control, agriculture, managed wetlands, waterfowl hunting and, and wildlife viewing. And then the primary biological benefits we targeted are additional habitat created, access to that habitat and improvements in fish survival. So we went through extensive public outreach and also developed a comprehensive suite of modeling tools to try to identify the best balance between how effective the project is at delivering those biological benefits and how acceptable the project is for its impact on land uses. Uh, we, I think that strategy is represented in the alternatives we looked at. So we looked at alternatives twice the size, which delivered significantly more biological benefits, but the impacts to recreational uses were correspondingly larger. Conversely, we looked at smaller alternatives that were aimed at reducing impacts on land uses, but those delivered only minimal biological benefits, which really didn't meet the project objectives. And so we think the project we selected represents the best intersection between biological benefits and land use impacts. And that project really is, it's a gated notch that's on the free east side of, of Fremont Weir. The operational period for that project is from November through March 15th. There's, there's really two operational periods. The, the first is from November through March 15th. And during that time, we will allow up to an additional 6,000 CFS into the Yolo Bypass. And then from March 15th through May 30th, up to 300 CFS. And, and the purpose there is really just for adult fish passage between March 15th and May. And those operations were really geared at minimizing land use impacts. The flows that come through the notch are based on Sacramento River elevation. So at lower elevations, very little flow can come through the notch. And then the maximum flow of 6,000 CFS is designed to occur just before Fremont Weir, otherwise would overtop and flood out the, the Yolo Bypass. So as you might have guessed, those operations are, are the reason why we need to secure easements. The bypass already experiences at least some flooding in most years. For most of the bypass, our project will cause an additional 10 to 15 days of water on properties. And, and that water will have a water surface raise of about three to six inches. And th those are averages. So those numbers will vary by year and, and also the specific location in the Yolo bypass. The easement itself is to create seasonal floodplain habitat and provide adult fish passage in the Yolo Bypass. But more specifically, our project need is to flow water over and on top of properties required for the present and future construction and operation of fish passage and floodplain restoration projects. And then in order for this project to perform correctly, we need easements across 100% of the parcels affected in, in the Yolo Bypass. Um, our goal is to complete these flow easement acquisitions by October of 2023 and that aligns with our required operational start date. So getting to the specific issue today regarding eminent domain, 
Our intent with the conversations we've had about the potential use of eminent domain authority is to be transparent with landowners. But I want to stress that our goal has always been to avoid condemnation as much as possible on this project going to its inception. And that's still our goal and our directive today is, is to try to avoid condemnation and minimize the, the chance of having to use it. We are hoping that we can successfully negotiate settlements with all of the affected property owners and we believe we, we have ample time to do so. Um, we've been working in good faith with landowners and many other stakeholders to develop this project. And we think we have a project that is, is highly effective and can be compatible with, with land uses in the Yolo Bypass. I think there's a, there are many landowners in the Yolo Bypass that do support this project. I think that's a testament to us finding the right balance. You know, we will negotiate in good faith to secure any necessary easements um, and, and hope that we can, we can do that through successful negotiations. In terms of our outreach, we've, we've added a step to our typical acquisition process, which is to meet with all landowners in the Yolo Bypass individually to explain our project and then delve into specific impacts on their properties and the state's land acquisition process and also identify what their role in that process is. And those meetings are really designed for landowners to ask questions and express concerns. You know, each property is unique. And um, we've been trying to stress that if there's some specific problem a landowner is concerned about, it's important that they engage with us and, and, are, and are openly communicative with us so that we best understand that concern because that will give us the best chance to be able to find an acceptable solution to them. So, and then beyond private negotiations, you, there's there are public lands in the bypass that are affected, and uh, you know overall there's a, there's a, there's a potential effect on Yolo County. We've we've been collaborating with with local agencies to try to um, you know minimize concerns. Just recently, we entered an agreement with Yolo County, which provides some economic protections for for unseen unforeseen economic consequences, and adds a Yolo bypass coordinator position to their staff. You know, in closing, I just want to say that this project is the culmination of more than 20 years of peer-reviewed work that have identified floodplains as a critical landscape in securing the long-term viability of salmon in this state. And for the past 10 years, we've done our best to find the best balance between the resource and land use impacts. And we will continue to do that at every step moving forward. So that concludes my presentation. I, ho I hope that I've given you the necessary information for you to be able to consider the matter before you today. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, James. Appreciate your presentation. Certainly, the conciseness by what you presented. I, I recognize there's a lot of work embodied here, and certainly to whittle that down, as you said, to uh, 10 minutes or so is, uh, is a task in and of itself. But thank you for, for uh, taking uh, the time and effort. And let me turn to commission members uh, uh, for uh, questions uh, regarding the presentation or anything related to this particular matter. I have Commissioner Viegas' hand raised. Okay. But, uh, Commissioner Vegas, Oscar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just be brief. First of yeah. all, thank you, James. Thank you. you did a great job of representing how complex is actually. It's much more complicated than what you 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 simplified it for us, and thank you for that. Um, having served on the subcommittee on behalf of the County of Yolo during the, the discussions and the negotiations with property owners and everybody involved, this is a big, big deal. Uh, and it and it it really is. I said this at the board meeting on Tuesday when we were discussing the aspects of the agreement with Yolo County. This is a big deal for, for a lot of different sectors in our community. Right? If, you're, if you're straight up all about flood protection, this, is, this, this helps. If you're about environmental preservation, this helps. If you're about flood plain restoration, if you're about, you know, if you're an angler and you're just worried about preserving endangered fish species, this, I mean, this has so many, so many benefits uh, for, for so many, so many of us. Uh, it's a big, big deal. So thank you for all your work. I uh, you did a great job of the presentation and I look forward to uh, my colleagues' comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Other members of the commission? Commissioner Eddy. Yes, Josh. Thank you, Chair. Um, James, thank you so much for your presentation. I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, DDOBR's perspective in terms of working with property owners on kind of settlement issues and kind of that commitment. Um, did you, do you have kind of an accounting of how many um, properties are impacted, private properties are impacted? Yeah, there, there's approximately, uh, you asked the question of, of private properties, correct? Yeah, um, I, I, the bulk of them are private properties and there's about 50 overall properties that are affected across approximately 200, um, sorry, 200 properties across 50 landowner groups. Those are, those are uh, rough numbers, but 
Um, I would I would prefer to you know follow up with correspondence with what the exact numbers are if, if it's um, important to you. Okay, Commissioner Eddie, anything else? No, thank you, sir. Okay, good. Other commissioners? Commissioner Slater? Yes. Tom. Yeah, just to be clear, so that's two diff 200 different property owners. Did I hear that right? On 50 different APNs? Uh, sorry, yeah. I, or uh, close to that. It's uh, 200 different APNs across 50 different ownership groups. 50 different owners on 200 APNs. Approximately. Yeah, approximately, I won't hold you to those numbers. So would you, it, the location of the majority of those or all of those or a portion of those, are they south of something? Can you identify about where most of that is? Yeah, so there, there's the stair step right around Liberty Island. It's, it's commonly called the stair step in the Yolo Bypass. and. Yes. Um, and so the, most of the properties would be north of there, all the way extending towards Fremont Weir. All north of that stair. Yeah, and then um, and then really it's the tidal the tidal flux down there that really drives inundation, and so we're not able to to change hydrology beyond that stair. And, and are you aware of or have knowledge of how many settlements have been made to date that you had to actively go after? Yeah, so for this specific project, we're, we're still early in, in the acquisition process. We've reached out to roughly uh, 20 um, ownership groups to, to this point and, and um, have not yet um, you know, started to begun the official acquisition process. Okay, and, and do you have enough knowledge going way back to when this project was getting off, uh, getting started, that this was a potential result did you always expect to have eminent domain and condemnation or were you under the impression that you thought you could pull it off without yeah so so going back to the inception our understanding of eminent domain is that at the very beginning we were not sure we have to use eminent domain but our response was that we were we were not considering eminent domain at the time but we always tried to clarify that if there was some other regulation in the future um, that required us to complete this project or was more, um, you know, had more of a, a stringent requirement that, that we may have to use it in the future. Okay, yeah, and, and just a comment, I, I appreciate your, your candor. And, uh, the department had to have known that this will be a major, major roadblock, uh, not just because, not because of any other reason than eminent domain is not, not something that any landowner likes to think about. So uh, I guess I don't have any more comments. I appreciate the, the knowledge and, and then everything you've uh, informed us to date, but um, I, I will vouch for all those landowners. It's gonna be a tough road. And, and one that I, I don't think, well, I'll, I'll hold, refrain judgment, but that's just something that's not gonna sit well. But, and I know you guys know that, or I hope you do. Thank you though very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Is it okay to respond just briefly to, to that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And so um, having been on the project team at the time, I think I think there was a lot of uncertainty about the, the project that might be selected and we cast a very broad net. And um, by having that goal of trying to minimize land use impacts, we looked at a lot of different creative solutions in terms of trying to do that. Um, including some properties, you know, if properties wanted to participate versus not wanting to participate. And after getting through the, the modeling and screening tools, you know, we learned that the, the projects were not delivering the biological benefits that they needed to, to meet our goals and objectives. Thank you. Can I ask a, a question uh, just on the project? So when you uh, are gonna <clears throat> potentially subject land that's farmed once the flood season has, uh, uh, you know, passed, I guess, that to, on average, uh, 15 more days of inundation, you're seeking flow easement, uh, Mr. Newcomb, but, you know, there, there are certainly are economic, but there's practical aspects to that from an agricultural standpoint for growing seasons and, you know, in order for lands to uh, dry to the point that they can be worked and such, and there are folks in this commission that are far more knowledgeable about agricultural practice and farming than I am, but um, 
I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious when you approach a farmer and say, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the deal, you know, we can talk about it, but ultimately in the back of your pocket, you've got, you know, and if you don't say yes, we can't come to terms that I'm going to take it anyway. And I'm not saying that that's how you present it. And that's not how you're approaching it, but that's pretty, you know, coming back to, to uh, you know, Tom's point a moment ago that um, that's a pretty stark reality, recognizing all the benefits that, you know, Supervisor Villegas called the Red Garden Project. And obviously Yolo County has been working very closely to represent his folks and certainly all the various interests here. But, um, you know, again, you're going to go to folks who have farmed some of them for generations there and recognize, you know, impacts that have come with the weir and passage of, of floodwaters during certain seasons and certainly certain years. But um, I guess I'm just curious, as, as you've talked in your team, you know, and in, again, in, it's not you directly, but you're going to have folks of, you know, land agents that are going to go out and, you know, make the approaches, try to do it cooperatively. But if you take eminent domain, you know, you already got the answer in your back pocket if, if people don't come around. So I'm, again, that, that's a balance. I get it. But I'm just, I'm just curious about, you know, because I think if people feel like going in, you may meet resistance just because of that. Because then, then I think people can say, you know, well, you know, and it's, you know, whatever the merits of project are, whatever the impacts, but, you know, the government approaches me and basically tell me that they're going to get it one way or the other. I'm just curious because, again, that's a different, you know, it's a, going into it, it presents a different, you know, kind of aura to, to the project, irrespective of the tremendous benefits that it would accrue. Yeah, th thank you for that comment. Um, I, th I think I understand, what, you know, um, the, the very important point that you're making there. Um, with, with You started out centering on the agriculture community and um, DWR recognizes the, the importance of, of Yolo Bypass for, for its agricultural history. Um, one of the key things that, that we worked through public outreach and stakeholder outreach and then really developing alternatives with some of the, the farm, farmers in, in the Yolo Bypass was identifying key dates. And so that is, that is the, the principal reason why we um, change operational periods on March 15th is, is to be able to have agriculture continue in, in the Yolo Bypass. Um, that was a concession that, that also resulted in, you know, pretty big reduced benefits to fish, um, but one that we felt we needed to make in order to have this project still meet the standard that it's acceptable to, to the Yolo Bypass. Um, so I hope that offers at least some, you know, consolation, um, you know, I guess I can, I'll just stop there. No, no, I, I appreciate it. So, so you, you settle on a date by which you, the, the, the waters would no longer pass through there and there's drying time and then uh, preparation time and so forth. Obviously it has a net impact on the rearing grounds for the, for, you know, for the fish. Um, but it also then provides farmers and what you're saying, what is the date now? What, what's the current date by which the, you have to cease passage? Yeah, so the, the current, the way the system currently works, it's completely passive. And so Fremont, Fremont Weir is a 1.8 mile wide uh, yes. weir that's just gravity overflow. Right. Um, and, our, and our notch is about 180 feet wide, you know, in that weir, but it's deeper. So we'll have some control over the stages below Fremont Weir, but there's still there's still a really good, you know, chance in some years that um, Fremont Weir is gonna overtop in, in, in some marches and, and still flood out landowners. So they'll still have to deal with that initial risk, um, but they won't have to deal with, um, you know, the risk of our, our project when we're operating for floodplain benefits um, after March 15th. So then just in case it was, um, because I didn't make it clear initially, is it from March 15th through May 30th, our goal then shifts to just providing adult fish passage and we could do that at a much uh, reduced rate. And so our initial operations there is 300 CFS. Okay, so you still maintain a flow down a narrow channel uh, for fish. Correct. All right, thanks. Okay, other uh, commission members? No, but we do have Melinda Terry. Okay, good. All right, let's go to the public. I know we've got still another important item on this agenda. To, 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 okay, we'll go to Melinda. Melinda. Uh, hi, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, I just uh, want to point out that before this was uh, the Big Notch Project, this was known as Conservation Measure 2 in the BDCP. I served on the steering committee, BDCP, um, on behalf of North Delta Water Agency. 
and I didn't take the time to bring out any of the colorful brochures that we were given, um, but they always talked about the willing sellers when it came to the conservation measures, which are the habitat um, restoration activities. Um, now, partly that was because in an HCP, um, the federal agencies require that um, typically, um, but I guess I would say that we had anticipated that those commitments by the state would be maintained, even though it was no longer um, part of an HCP. So it does feel a little bit like broken promises in terms of the path that the state had been on. Um, and I would say that, you know, remind everybody that, you know, first of all, North Delta just feels like we're the, the target for a lot of these um, biological opinion activities. And with all due respect to, you know, the state. Um, these projects, again, benefit the export areas where water is exported out of the Delta. They don't benefit the Delta. When you do eminent domain, which wearing my flood hat, we obviously do, those levees in that case that were eminent domaining protect those locals. This eminent domain is being done to provide benefits somewhere else. They aren't providing a benefit locally like you normally do in an eminent, eminent domain project. Um, and I would just, you know, say that in addition to, you know, um, the presenter mentioned the goals and objectives of the project. Well, with all due respect, these private landowners have goals and objectives for their properties too, um, as well. And I think that really needs to be respected. And I do think that's why um, the staff recommendation that is proposed as well as the letter um, is appropriate, you know, and we encourage the, the commission to really um, approve that and, and send that off. And as it says in this, I believe in the staff report, it is consistent with what's done for the private lands on the LURMP. Thank you. Good, thank you, Linda. Okay, any other hands up, Stacy? No, there are no hands. All right, then I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, me, Mr. Bink, anything you wanted to, I guess we'll bring it back to you, we, unless there's any questions. Mr. Yeah, I just that that's that's all a great lead in into the requested action. There is a uh, a letter to DWR Director Namath that is included in the meeting packet. Um, the basic thrust of the letter is the concern over the use of eminent domain to acquire the interests in land. And as I understand from and by the way, I do want to thank James and other members of the DWR team. They were very generous and sharing their time uh, in helping me prepare this item for the commission and sharing information about their project. Um, in, in learning about the project uh, and the intention to utilize eminent domain if necessary, and that's an important qualifier if necessary, uh, it's possible that uh, this important, that the um, interest acquired can solely be an inundation easement. I was told that in some instances there might be enough uh, uh, impact to the land that the intention would be to acquire the land in, in fee outright purchase of the land instead of just acquiring an additional inundation easement. It, it should be noted that the Ola Bypass already has inundation easements on it, but this as uh, Mr. Newcomb stated this would create additional inundation periods. Uh, and so that's why DWR is acquiring uh, these additional interests in land. Uh, although although uh, DWR staff had indicated that um, they had utilized uh, a threat of condemnation to acquire certain habitat restoration properties in the Delta, I don't think there's any dispute that this would be the most widespread use of that power um, uh, for this project. And as uh, Melinda Terry stated, um, at least according to our land use and resource management plan, which I recognize only applies to local government actions and not to actions by state agencies. But if you carry forward that logic in the land use and resource management plan, we state pretty clearly a concern about the use of eminent domain for the activities, land use activities in the Delta. So no, uh, no uh, dispute about uh, the importance of the project. Um, the commission did provide some limited comment on this when it was going through the environmental review process. 
at that time, it wasn't uh, clear to us that the intention was to utilize eminent domain if necessary. If that had been the case, we certainly would have expressed that concern and voiced it in our comment letter on the environmental document. Um, we're concerned, uh, the staff is concerned about the precedent this might set for the use of eminent domain for future habitat restoration projects in the Delta. And that's really all the background leading up to my request for the commission's approval of the draft letter included in the meeting packet. Just on that last point, Eric, so it's your staff analysis that as you've sort of qualified here, but that this may have been used um, on occasion, uh, at least in your conversation with, with DWR staff in the past, but this would be significantly, in my word, precedential um, if it were you, uh, if applied to this project. Again, I, I, I said significant, but this would be precedential, I guess. Yeah, I did hear you say that, so. Yeah, I, I think both of those terms are appropriate. Um, th th this project would affect thousands of acres. Um, James might have the exact number at his ready. Um, uh, I don't want to be more precise than thousands. I think it's in excess of 10,000 acres. And certainly the examples that were cited to me about <clears throat> acquisitions completed under threat of condemnation were much, much, much reduced from that number. So both, both a significant expansion of the, of the use, again, if it's necessary, but also a concern about whether this would establish a precedent for future habitat restoration activities. And our, our commission documents are pretty clear that our, our, our preference for habitat restoration is that it occur on publicly owned land or land owned by conservation entities. There's literally in excess of 60,000 acres that fall under that category within the Delta. It's not an insignificant part of the total land acreage in the Delta. Um, we would have a concern about the use of um, eminent domain as we would just additional acquisitions of privately owned land for habitat restoration purposes, especially when so much land is already in public ownership throughout the Delta. Okay, commission members then, um, time for um, other comments, thoughts, and then obviously we have a matter for our consideration for uh, action here. So, commission members, do we have hands, Stacy? There are no hands. Um, um, Mr. Chair, this is Dennis, uh, Commissioner Agar. Yes, yes. Uh, just, just for my clarification, being new to this commission this, this year, um, just want to confirm that the, within this commission is uh, within the, I guess, the uh, preview of these types of state um, processes that are available when these types of projects uh, occur out there. Just, just want to make sure that um, this is something that we normally comment on uh, when it comes to these types of uh, impacts in, in the Delta. Uh, and then the second question or comment really is, uh, you know, in the transportation world and definitely very uh, empathetic on, on having to use any eminent domain um, uh, uh, protocols to, to get very important projects done uh, in the transportation arena. And one of the things I, I, I and I apologize, I couldn't raise my hand. I, for some reason, I don't have the raise option hand in my, in my system, but uh, back to, to DWR and James, uh, at, at least from the limited uh, understanding on eminent domain, uh, like you said, it's, it's the last um, you know, uh, result if, if necessary. And again, it's almost the last thing that any state agency would do uh, but I'm assuming that everything would be exhausted as far as settlement, uh, compensation, uh, mitigation uh, to the property owners due to any impacts uh, that the project may have uh, and that it will go through the normal process to make sure that the, the impacted property owner uh, is seriously uh, considered um, um, and that they're concerns are addressed uh, as best as, as the department can. So just just 
I guess that's more of a question and, and, and I'm not sure how the DWR projects work, but just wanted to get more clarification on um, making sure that uh, everything is done and exhausted to, to minimize any impacts to any property owner. Okay. Gary, James? Yeah, so I see that our, our right-of-way agent is, is on and has his hand raised and I, I'm, I'd like to yield to him. I think he might want to answer this question if that's okay. His name's Linus Paulus, it's with DWR. Okay, Mr. Paulus. Thanks, James. And, and yes, uh, it is the state's responsibility to exhaust all avenues through negotiation. We're looking to landowners to participate in the process to identify the issues to uh, the cost to cure any damages to the property or mitigate those damages. Um, I am directly responsible for the other uh, acquisitions via eminent domain that was met, were mentioned earlier by Eric. And I would assure you that if you contacted those landowners, they'd be very happy with the supplements they received. And this is not really setting a precedent. Thank you. Question? We have Commissioner Vasquez hand raised. Okay, all right, go on. So if there's no other comments, I certainly would move to send this letter. That for okay. send this letter. I, I think it's important that we make this statement. I mean, this country is built on property rights and the right to defend those property rights. Uh, certainly, uh, we would expect the state or any agency looking to acquire property that they do all that that's necessary and that if they have to go to that resort, the last resort. But I think once you make these kinds of statements, it reminds me of the movie The Godfather. Only one of two things can be on this contract, your signature or your brains, or the loss of land in this case. So I'm very supportive of the letter that's been drafted for us. Okay, all right, we have a motion. Do we have a second to the motion? Any hands raised? I'll second it, Commissioner all right. Slater. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second, second uh, to approve uh, the transmittal letter uh, as uh, included in our packet and certainly with an acknowledgement of the discussion in response to questions. Any further commission comments before I call for a vote? I see no hands raised. And yeah, also, uh, I wasn't able to catch who seconded the motion, if I could. Uh, Commissioner Slater. Okay, Stacy, I'll turn to you. Okay. Oh. Chair Natoli? Aye. Vice Chair Wynn? Yes. Commissioner Viegas? Aye. Commissioner Vasquez? Yes. Commissioner Fuller? Aye. Commissioner Steele? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Nakanishi? Aye. Commissioner Paroli? Aye. Commissioner Slater? Aye. Commissioner Agar? I'm staying. Commissioner Eddy? Staying. Commissioner Vogel? No. Commissioner Bush? Abstain. Thank you. Chair Natoli, we have nine yeses, three abstains, and one no. Okay. All right, thank you, members of the commission. Thank you to uh, our presenters and commenters. Uh, appreciate the deliberation and uh, with that, then the letter will be uh, sent forward. Okay, I know we've gone long here, so and but we have obviously a very important topic uh, to uh, give a report on, and uh, we have some panelists who are going to share with us. So I recognize that we're past the six o'clock hour here. So <clears throat> at any rate, uh, I'll call for item thirteen, which is a, a discussion about drought activities in the Delta. And uh, again, we got presentations by Michael George, our Delta Water Master, Jacob McQuirk uh, from the Department of Water Resources. And Melinda Terry from the North Delta Water Agency. Eric, did you want to introduce this? And again, I don't want to shorten your time. I know this is a matter of great interest to every Californian. Uh, but we'll try to guess this, but also allow sufficient time to have it. Yeah, no, I would just turn it over to Michael, then Jacob, then Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay, very good. Okay. Michael, good evening. Good evening. Thank you. And I, uh, I will be quick. I know you're. Uh, uh, had a long agenda and uh, 
so I'll, I'll move quickly through this and I'll apologize, Chair Natoli, that um, at the DPC meeting, which you attended on Monday, you got to see uh, much of this presentation. Don't, don't apologize. I, I learn something every time you present, okay. <laughs> Mr. Watermaster. Thanks. Go well, I, I can also say that there have been uh, developments since Monday, so stay tuned. <laughs> there, are, there are some new things. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I, I want to give a quick uh, step through the evolution uh, of, of what's happened just since the end of May or the beginning of May. At the end of April, on April 29th, uh, Term 91 was triggered because the Delta came into balance conditions and we had drought in the entire Delta watershed as the map here indicates. And on May 10th, the governor proclaimed a state of emergency on account of the drought throughout the Delta watershed. Um, within a few days of that, specifically May 17th, the projects came to the State Water Board with a temporary urgency change petition to ask the board to uh, relax some environmental standards with the objective of reducing demands on the projects, potentially keeping the Delta in, in salinity balance, but doing it kind of closer to the edge and thereby maintaining more water in storage in case we have a dry year next year and certainly in case of the need, the not in case of the need, because of the uh, need for cold water to sustain the uh, winter run below Shasta Dam. So uh, in addition, uh, during this period of time, uh, my colleagues in the Division of Water Rights uh, presented uh, a new and uh, improved, and I will say that sincerely, dramatically improved methodology for determining water unavailability within the Delta watershed. So that was May. Next slide, please. Um, we moved uh, uh, pretty quickly to June. And uh, at the June 1st meeting of the Water Board, there were presentations about how the drought was evolving. And uh, we'll compare these maps uh, in, a, uh, in another slide, but recognize that the drought was getting much worse particularly in the northern part of the watershed. And also on the 1st of June, the state board approved an order or adopted an order approving the temporary urgency change petition with a number of conditions primarily aimed at um, making sure that the uh, salinity continued to be re re repulsed because we recognize that obviously maintaining a freshwater estuary is a very high priority. In fact, probably the highest priority in terms of managing under uh, decision 1641. There were uh, a deadline for filing objections a few days later. The uh, TUCP uh, is still open, could be updated. Don't know whether that's going to happen, but uh, stay tuned on that. On June 15th, However, the Division of Water Rights sent notices to all water rights holders in the entire Delta watershed, some 17,000 registered water rights, alerting them, number one, that based on the best information available to the Water Board, there was no water available at priorities post-1914. So in implementing the priority system, this notice was to say, based on the information, the Division of Water Rights, the State Board, and the Office of Delta Water Master had, there is no water available at those more junior priorities. And importantly, uh, alerting others to the fact, uh, even, even more senior water rights, that it was likely, as we saw the evolution of this drought, that there would be uh, the need to uh, curtail diversions at even uh, higher priorities, that is earlier than uh, 1914. So um, we, we moved through uh, to the end of June. Next slide, please. And the, the uh, drought continued to get worse. Um, going back to the governor's proclamation of May 10th, the board is directed to consider emergency regulations to consider how to extend um, curtailments 
to protect the most senior water rights as required under the priority system and to protect um, releases of stored water. Those are the two issues in paragraph five of the governor's proclamation. Um, so those emergency regulations are being developed. There's a public process for that. We are anticipating now that those um, emergency regulations may be uh, uh, draft, staff draft of those may be available by um, uh, the 20th, 22nd, 23rd, sometime in that time frame, uh, so that there can be a workshop to take uh, input on that and also to uh, uh, provide the board with more information when those emergency regulations are proposed to the board. And there's a, 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 an effort to get those emergency regulations before the board at its August 3rd meeting. That's an incredibly uh, fast track time frame, but that's the nature of the, the rapid evolution of this route. Uh, on last Thursday, July 8th, so after I put these slides in, the governor uh, expanded the drought uh, proclamation. And one of the things that he did there was to say, um, conservation has become a California way of life. We recognize that, we can see that, say from base year 2013, there have been important efforts to maintain conservation. But in light of how bad this drought is and how it has developed in such a ferocious fashion in such a short period of time, the governor called for voluntary increases in conservation efforts with the goal of an additional 15% over water after over last year, 2020. So that is a request for all water users. Obviously, some are gonna be able to make it, some may be able to overdo it or go beyond the 15%. And I think the key element of that message is this drought is getting worse and it's getting worse quickly. And any water savings helps at the margin to reduce pressure on a system which is under excruciating pressure. So um, uh, we've also recognized that there are anomalies both to water quality and to the models for uh, what we expect in a drought. And if we could just go to the next slide, this is lining up those same three uh, maps. And you can see just in a little over a month how the exceptional drought has enveloped the entire watershed. So we're in this together. It's bad. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll see that um, Drought in the Delta is obviously experienced differently than it is elsewhere in the watershed, where it's elsewhere in the watershed, it's experienced as a lack of physical water. In the Delta, it's not lack of physical water, it's primarily rapid deterioration in quality. So all three of these pictures were taken in the Delta uh, in, in the month of June, and you can see how earlier than in our experience, the water quality has deteriorated. In addition, we've got um, not only harmful algae bacteria, but a fairly explosive and concerning growth of uh, particularly submerged aquatic weeds, invasive weeds. So lots and lots of bad news here. Let's go to the last slide with maybe one ray of good news. And that is, I wanna give, uh, kudos to the three Delta water agencies whose boards starting in February recognizing the issues with respect to the to the drought directed their general managers for the North Central and South Delta to come together uh, in a process that I convened to see if we could take a leadership role if the water agencies on behalf of water users could take a leadership role in developing a positive uh, uh, cooperative effort to respond to the dry conditions, not only of this year, but to build on that potentially for future dry years, or if this drought continues into future years. 
the, I won't go into the details here, but there are three legs to this stool. One is much better quality of data so that we're all reading from the same manual. We know what the facts are in terms of water use, demand, et cetera. Secondly, to conserve water wherever and however it can be done, recognizing that it is different in different parts of the Delta. But again, we're all in this together, trying to conserve where we can. And finally, and I think in many ways, most importantly, to protect the water quality in the Delta as a freshwater estuary. Because if we lose that through salinity intrusion, we not only lose uh, on the environmental side, on the uh, uh, water uh, reliability side, but the process of recovering from salinity intrusion requires an enormous amount of water uh, and, and probably a, a significantly long time. So what we're looking at through this planning process with the state team and the Delta Water Agency's team is to find where we can cooperate to achieve common objectives. We're in a, in a planning stage here. We've had good engagement between the representatives of the uh, uh, water agencies in the Delta and the state team, including Fish and Wildlife, DWR, the Water Board, uh, trying to figure out what solutions we might be able to develop on a voluntary basis through efforts of water users in the Delta. So I think this is more than uh, an incidental um, silver lining to a very dark cloud. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over to Jacob, who is uh, the primary responsibility for uh, one of the most important aspects of uh, managing water quality in Delta, and that is salinity management. So Jacob, over to you. Hey, hey, Jacob, you're very hard to hear. I might be the only one, but I, if you could maybe get a little closer to your microphone. Yes. Is that any better, Eric? No. No. Still pretty faint. Still pretty faint. Sorry about that. That's not good. Let me, you know, uh, this is, this is not, I'm not, let's see. I mean, I'm right at the mic, so maybe it's an issue with the wrong microphone. Yes, it is. How's that? Is that better? Oh, yeah, we got you. <laughs> You're coming through loud and clear. All right, sorry about that, folks. Uh, again, can, um, are you going to bring the PowerPoint up or would you like me to share the screen? We'll bring it up, Jacob. Excellent. So again, I'm, I'm Jacob McQuirk and I'm with the Department of Water Resources. Um, I'm the manager of the South Delta Branch and I'm also the manager for the emergency drought barrier. And so today uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, about the drought and some of the actions that we are taking uh, to mitigate the effects of this drought. Um, so again, this is, um, we're gonna talk about the 2021 emergency drought barrier. That is a channel closure across False River to help us uh, conserve water in upstream reservoirs. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about um, our efforts in case things get worse. And, and I would have to say that uh, these are scary times and we are definitely hoping that this drought will break and we i mean that would be the best news in the world for us is that uh, the drought is is breaking and our reservoirs are filling back up uh, next slide please so um, i'm not going to get into this too much just because uh michael did an excellent job of uh, painting the picture of just how bleak and dry times are um, and the fact that we had a couple um, executive orders that uh, helped us uh, get move forward with some actions to mitigate these droughts. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a slide that that I, I'm a I'm, I I like quite a bit, and why? Because it's the eight station index, and as a water resource engineer, this is something we look at whether it's dry times or whether it's uh, times of flooding. And that blue line there, that is this current year. And as you can see there with my cursor right there, uh, 23.1 inches, and it is perfectly flat. And that is really not what we want to see. So we're seeing that. Uh, this is make, turning out to be the second driest year on record. So uh, things are extremely dry. Uh, next slide, please. And so what do we have to do is we have to take whatever actions we can uh, to preserve water in our upstream reservoirs, to preserve water so that 
uh, th those waters are available later in the season for beneficial uses. So what we've done is we, we prepared a drought contingency plan in that plan we have to take actions and specifically there are two actions that we've taken to help conserve water and help uh, uh, preserve water such that it might be available later in the year for beneficial uses and also to preserve the quality of the interior delta. And so what folks probably already know is that uh, the way our uh, water supply system in California and the delta works, it's the release and the natural flow of fresh water from upstream reservoirs that uh, push the salts out and keep the salts at bay. And every tidal cycle, um, every tidal rise, you've got those uh, saltier ocean waters pushing into the delta. And so what we've done is we've taken two actions. The first is um, we applied for a temporary urgency change uh, to our water rights, specifically D1641, to allow some relaxation. And what that relaxation, one of the primary things it does, it allows our net delta outflow to be reduced. And so uh, specifically from about 4,000 to 3,000 CFS. And what you're seeing on the right, on the right is uh, the results of some of our hydrodynamic modeling. And in the left panel, you'll see this is um, the no barrier condition. And then on the right panel, this is the barrier condition. And so really what happens is in the no barrier condition, every tidal cycle, um, you get a tidal rise and that saltier water pushes into Frank's Track. Frank's Track, for those that may or may not know, that's a flooded island and it's in the interior delta. And so every tidal cycle, you get salt further injected. And so really what we're doing is we're changing the plumbing here. And but what we're doing is we've blocked, uh, actually what we have done is we've blocked off False River. And so False River, it is a very large conveyance into Frank's Track. And again, every tidal cycle, we get that saltier water pushing in. So by blocking that channel, what you're doing is you're changing the filling into Frank's track. So the filling is no longer uh, from False River and from uh, the San Joaquin River. You're getting more uh, filling um, in the northeastern corner of Frank's track through Old River. And what folks may know is that that's going to be fresher water. That's water you're going to see. Uh, more water that's coming in from the Delta Cross Channel, uh, more water that's coming in from the Delta, uh, from Georgiana Slough. And so you're getting fresher water. And really what it does is it doesn't make the salinity better. What we're doing is we're, we're able to preserve the existing salinity in the Delta with the release of less fresh water. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we did is uh, we Actually, uh, this was quite a hurry. Uh, it was definitely the fastest I have ever worked on a project. Um, I was the project manager back in 2015 when we uh, made a similar closure here at Falls River. And so really, um, we didn't have a lot of time. And so in about three weeks, uh, we were able to acquire all regulatory permits to allow us to install this barrier. Um, and one thing that did happen is through the governor's emergency executive order, um, the California Environmental Quality Act was uh, suspended specifically for this action. And so that did enable us uh, to expedite um, all state permits. So we did specifically go out and get all the same state permits uh, with the exception of the, um, the Delta Protection uh, or the Delta Stewardship Council's um, a Delta plan consistency that was also exempted through the executive order. But other than that, we acquired all the normal state uh, permits. And we also worked with the US Army Corps of Engineers to acquire uh, the federal authorization to allow us to install this barrier. Um, and so uh, we actually begun construction on June 3rd. Um, and that was a couple days into standby. So it was definitely a, uh, uh, a stressful situation for myself uh, watching uh, these, these, these contractors just standing by waiting for those permits to come in, but they did come in. And uh, we, what we did is we structured our contract um, in a good way that allowed us to, protect, to pull rock from either of two locations. One location was our existing stockpile in Rio Vista, and another location was the uh, stockpile that the Division of Flood Management has developed at the Port of Stockton. And so um, we awarded the contract to Kiewit um, and Kiewit, um, they actually pulled material from the stockpile in downtown Stockton, that stockpile that's there uh, for flood fight and other purposes. And they brought that material to False River with barges and they placed that material across the channel. Um, and this particular contract was an accelerated contract. We actually provided a bonus structure to the contractor to close early. 
and the contractor was able uh, to close 10 days early and um, receive their bonus for that. And so we were able to, uh, we had hydraulic closure about the 18th. Um, and that means the, ban the barrier started doing its job. And we were actually complete with construction on the 23rd. Um, I, I, I will note there is an error on this slide. I meant to mention that earlier. And so what you'll see is we say that um, uh, the latest uh, completion for removal is November 15th. That was the case in 2015, but it is not the case this year. We actually have till November 30th. Uh, we will start removal of this barrier uh, prior to October, and there is a permit condition uh, for the protection of giant garter snake that, that requires that. So we'll start removal of the barrier, and the removal process will be slow going. We anticipate it'll take the better part of 60 days to remove this barrier, and we will have the barrier fully removed. Um, that's the current plan uh, by November 30th of this year. Um, next slide, please. And so one of the things that's very important is, you know, we really don't know if this drought's going to break. As I mentioned earlier, that is, of course, what we would like to happen. We would like to see our reservoirs fill up and, you know, no longer have to deal with a drought. But that's just not what we're planning for. So what are we planning for? We're planning for continued bad conditions. And what does that mean? What that means is there's a few different things that we're doing. Uh, one of the primary actions we're taking is we are working uh, to get standard environmental permits um, to allow us to reinstall this barrier up to two additional times during a 10 year time frame. And uh, that would allow us to install the barrier again as early as the spring of 2022. And it would allow us to install it one additional time up through 2031. And so we are working on that, um, and that is um, something that's very important. We're also working um, outreach. So we've got outreach going, and we're working with the Delta, um, Delta Stewardship Council, um, IEP, State Water Board, USGS, and many others uh, to try to uh, really get a good, do a good job of evaluating the effects of not just drought, but the effects of our drought barrier. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that we're doing. And one thing, uh, another thing that I'd like to mention is Unlike what we're doing in this current emergency action, uh, we do uh, plan to solicit uh, public comments. And so our plan on that, and it's gonna be quite a push to get this out, is we are planning to release our California Environmental Quality Act document this summer. Uh, currently, we're hoping to target uh, before the end of August for that release. Um, we have already completed our AB 52 tribal consultation. And during that time, uh, we really, you know, we really do want to solicit the, you know, the comments of the public and um, stakeholders, agencies, and really to, to make sure that we're doing the best job we can. And so that's something that's a little different. Um, and so that's something that we do look forward to. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, and so what I had just talked about, that was all with regards to the West Falls River channel closure. And through a series of hydrodynamic modeling that we've completed and other actions, we had determined that uh, that West Falls River channel closure, that is the most effective channel closure to mitigate drought effects. That's the one that's currently in place. And it is enabling us, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the issuance of the uh, temporary urgency change order, to reduce, reduce our delta outflow and basically to be able to manage the interior delta salinity for the protection of the interior delta and beneficial uses as well as uh, being able to continue uh, minimal state water project and Central Valley project exports. Uh, that, is, that is working now, but unfortunately conditions could get worse. And so what we're doing now is we're also looking at uh, the potential to install additional barriers as soon as next year in 2022 if conditions do not improve. Um, and so what we're really doing there is we're working, um, working with, and these barriers as are pointed out, as thank you for pointing out, that would be up at uh, Sutter Slough and up at Steamboat Slough. And really the dynamics here of what these barriers do, I mentioned what the dynamics of the West Falls River Barrier do, uh, changing the plumbing there in the interior del delta. What these barriers do is they keep more water in the Sacramento River and so that's more water that's going to uh, help repel the, um, the saltier water from coming in from the ocean. And so that's really what they do. Um, but there are a lot of concerns associated with these northern barriers. Um, and so what we are doing is we're, we're starting some initial outreach. We're continuing with our modeling. 
and we're going to reach out and we're going to look for ways to to mitigate and minimize any impacts associated with these barriers. Um, that includes uh, minimizing any sort of impacts to uh, water rights holders and diverters up in the North Delta. It also includes taking a good look at levees. Um, back in 2015, uh, we did um, receive an exemption from uh, participation with the uh, state flood board, but with this particular year, we are not. Uh, so we are going to engage with uh, uh, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, as well as with the local uh, maintaining agencies, and really try to uh, make sure that what we do um, leaves those, it, those levees in better condition than when they are today. Um, so, you know, we'll do whatever is necessary to assure um, that we will not have any impacts on levees. And we're going to do everything we can as well uh, to minimize impacts to local landowners as well as minimizing impacts to uh, the environment. And so there was also some pretty um, uh, large environmental concerns that we're working through. Specifically, um, this would be blocking uh, passage of um, anadromous fish. And so we, have, we are going to be looking at studies and ways to minimize that. But the last thing that I would, I would want to add on these potential uh, 22 channel closures is that these are something that we really do not want to do. And so really the way to look at these, these are just a deeper level of contingency planning if conditions get even worse than where they are today. And so again, this is, we have absolutely no desire to build these barriers, but we are planning and taking every step we can such that we are more prepared if that is a tool that we have to do. Uh, next slide, please. And so really that's, that's the basics of what I've got is um, that is kind of what we're up to. It looks like they're, um, uh, so we are again, working to um, get standard approvals to uh, build the West Falls River barrier again, two more times and the 22 through 31 time period. And we're also working on planning and working with local constituents such that if we have to uh, go to building northern barriers, then we will do everything we can to minimize and mitigate those impacts as well. And so really, I, I appreciate everybody's time. And that's, that really concludes my presentation on the actions that DWR is taking currently to try to mitigate some of the effects of this really bad drought. And uh, it is a really a severe situation that we're in. And it's a, it's a scary situation for all of us. And that's what I'll leave it with. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Jacob. And uh, I know we're going to turn to Melinda. I would just say, as you look to 2022 and your contingency plans, as you pointed them out, I think keeping this commission involved, but certainly you know working with local folks. Obviously, there's a whole uh, array of uh, entities and agencies. Uh, and I know uh, the last time around when those discussions took place regarding Sutter and Steamboat, they were fairly contentious and controversial, and they obviously weren't installed. But um, I appreciate the fact that you are going to engage folks. And I think the earlier the better, again, uh, certainly with your referencing the situation we're currently in, and hopefully we'll, ne we'll never reach the point we need to do that. But um, OK, anyway, thank you, Jacob. And uh, I'm going to hold questions at the commission level because I know we're running way late. I want to give an opportunity for Melinda to present, and then we'll bring it back to the commission uh, for any closing questions or comments. So thanks again, Jacob and Michael both. OK, Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Melinda Terry, manager for the North Delta Water Agency. I appreciate being invited back to talk about how what our agency is doing to deal with the drought. I'm just so sorry that it's so close to the last time when I spoke to you in 2015. I wish there had been more time in between. Um, next slide. Um, there are really, for us, there are two what I call drought assurances that um, we rely on for our water quality and water availability. The first, of course, is the D1641 Delta Water Quality Plan. Um, and then what I'm calling our drought insurance policy, which uh, that's just one of the many benefits in the, the 1981 contract that we have for water supply availability and quality um, with the Department of Water Resources. I'll pause here just though to point out that um, our drought insurance policy uh, you know, does allow us to um, uh, when the individual property water rights are curtailed that they can continue diverting. They have to be able to fill out the form with the water board to let them know that they are diverting under the North Delta water contract water supply. Um, 
But water quality, of course, is a big part of our contract as well. We have specific criteria. We have seven monitoring locations. And I would just say that this year, um, we are ex uh, experiencing the fact that DWR is uh, exceeding our criteria. They're not in compliance. And at our three mile slough location, they have not been in compliance since June 28th. Um, and we've also seen some periodic um, exceedances at the Rio Vista monitoring station, which for instance, I don't believe we did in 2014, 15. So it's kind of telling us, you know, something different, which I think will circle back to where Jacob left off about, you know, barriers and maybe the benefits that those can um, apply, um, hopefully. But um, th the other thing that you should be aware of is I believe that um, I don't know if they are, I didn't check today, but they have been, um, uh, the projects, two water projects have been out of compliance and exceeding the um, criteria that was approved in the TUCP, which as Jacob said, is a relaxation of D1641. Um, so they're exceeding even that criteria, I believe the three mile slew. Um, next slide. Um, the uh, these are just some of the things that obviously you see the reduced flows, salinity intrusions, the health warnings, um, um, the blue green algae. Um, but of course, the first two, the reduced flows and salinity, that definitely relates to our contract. And as many of you know, the pumps, many of the pumps are um, siphons, they're gravity. So they, you know, don't operate when they, you get these change in the surface water elevations. And really what it does is they have to have a longer period to be able to irrigate. But we as an agency have really been trying to communicate with landowners, our farmers, to please check the sea deck, which has all of these monitoring stations. And they really need to check it daily because these fluctuations because of the tidal exchange really does occur, but can be very critical for their ir daily irrigation. So we've been trying to share that with everybody. When you look at the algae, I think it was mentioned by Michael, it's kind of concerning because it's a little bit earlier and it's more widespread. We're seeing it in other areas that we haven't before. And um, you know, I'm gonna assume that this really has impacts on our municipal supplies because you know, they have to do things to clean it, Contra Costa Water District and North Bay Aqueduct. Um, and the science is still out on whether it has effects on crops, but in my reading on this subject, it does appear that there are studies going on in other states on that, but it's something for us in the future to keep an eye on. Um, next slide. Um, this, I'm, I'm calling, this is just a lot of spinning plates and they've already been touched on by both Michael um, and Jacob, uh, the drought contingency plan um, that the projects do, um, the local response plan that the three Delta agencies have been working with the water master and the state team. Oh, could you go back? Thanks. Um, uh, that, you know, we kind of missed the, the, the timeline for our farmers for this year, but I think farmers in general really try to be judicious in droughts. And so, as Michael said, we do have better tracking mechanisms a little bit. And of course, it's about planning for next year as, as Jacob was also saying, in, in case things worsen and continue. Um, the T, we have one TUCP, there could be more. Um, curtailment notices were already mentioned, the drought barriers. Um, I think I'll, I'll touch on this a, a little bit in, in the future, but I do think it's important to note that even the topics I'll bring up on that is, I really spent a lot of time looking back. I like to look back what's done in the past and um, the drought barriers really do work. Um, so that's the good news. Um, and the warning signs the counties have had to do for the blue green algae. The one thing I'll add is our contract, we have a drought provision, emergency drought provision. It does include a uh, claims process. And um, because of the water quality exceedances that I had mentioned, and the last slide that we're experiencing that DWR is currently not or hasn't been in compliance. Um, we are in a discussion with DWR about, DWR about implementing that claims process. Um, next slide. Um, so Jacob mentioned, you know, the you know that they're you know one of the things they're looking at is the potential for uh, two more barriers, and if next year you know conditions do not improve. And again, when I, you know, it, it just feels like this year is also feeling, you know, already feeling like 1976, which in that year um, they did install, they did not install West Falls River, but they installed the Sutter barrier. Um, in 1977, they did not 
um, install the Sutter barrier, but I think they installed like five or six other barriers throughout the Delta. And from what I read, they were really trying to protect Contra Costa water districts intakes and some other um, areas down south. But really when um, I think I'll just briefly, you know, touch on this, but I hope that in the future we can come back and really talk about these um, barriers that may need to be looked at for next year. Um, Jacob mentioned, you know, we've, he's already outreached to our agency. We have a meeting plan, I think, on the 21st, probably the first of many. So, but these are the types of things I'm, I'm hoping to make progress with the state this time that we were unable to make progress in 2014 and 15. Um, but uh, when you look at 76, when they installed Sutter Slough, there was a lot of pre preliminary work that was done to survey every single one of those intakes beforehand, before installation. And they monitored them daily, kind of like our RDs monitor the levees every day. Um, and then they also executed a memorandum of permit with the North Delta Water Agency that had a list of mitigation measures that included things like um, um, and uh, having available on site on a couple of different islands, portable pumps in the power plants. They even built an overland pipe at Ryer Island with some three portable pumps. So there, there was just a lot of those types of mitigations um, that was in that agreement. Um, they of course had also, because of the recreational boating, um, some things in there and of course a, a point for the fish to get through in the middle and and they did a lot of fish die things in their preliminary surveys as well. And then under remediation in our agreement, really they also um, reimbursed our agency for any costs that we had for legal engineering and manager costs for dealing with that installation and removal. Um, and to also hold us harmless for their project if there were um, claims. So we really do, we were unable to get the state to agree to renew this same agreement, you know, if, even though they were looking at Sutter and Steamboat. Um, so that's, you know, where Jacob comes in and we're trying our outreach earlier because the thought is we really need to be working together and prepared and ready for his team, you know, to be as quick as they were, frankly, doing the second installation this time, you know, like they did in 2015 for False River. So if we do this right, I think that's what we'll be able to do. Next slide, please. Um, which just, I think this is my last slide leads me um, to my last point, which, you know, sometimes the dire conditions bring people together in emergency situations. And so I think if we, again, you know, just have this better um, compliance with to the best they can of our water quality, or we do things like the comp, um, claims process, um, communication. When you look back at the 76, 77 drought, DWR actually had this outreach, I think they originally called it outreach operations office and then 77 they called it the out, um, uh, drought information office. But that was a lot of what they did. They were doing extensive public education and outreach. And, and really it's finally our cooperation, you know, to try to really work together so that again, we have a smooth um, and really uh, opportunity that we are able to work together and get these agreements in place so that both the reclamation districts that are impacted and North Delta Water Agency can um, hopefully support these projects as they go forward with their regulatory um, permitting. Um, and I guess I'll just end it with, I agree with the statement. Ooh, I was right on time. Um, I did a timer on myself. <laughs> um, is I'll just end with, I liked the statement that Michael made that I agree with him that we're in this together. Um, so we just have to continue to try to do a little better job of that moving forward because this will not be the last time we're dealing with it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Melinda. And again, thank you to Michael, to Jacob and to Melinda. I know we're way past time here, but um, if there are any commission members that have, you know, maybe a, a question or, or two for our panelists, uh, again, recognizing the time here, but um, we have some expertise uh, with us that, uh, um, it could be helpful if you have a question. So any any hands raised, uh, AC? I don't have any commissioner hands raised at the moment from what I can see. I do have Russ Ryan, however. Okay, all right, so let me just make sure no commissioners, uh, no questions. Uh, uh, if not, then we'll go to Russ Ryan, Mr. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners. I just wanted to speak on behalf of Metropolitan and we, fully support and 
uh, thinking forward uh, for critical droughts. And I know we've had discussions with the group that Michael George had, had identified with local water users. As you know, we own 20,000 acres, so we're in the same, the same situation and, and issues. So we're, we wanna do our part to help support and any resources that we have, uh, we are dedicating to help solve some of the solutions moving forward. Obviously, again, as Melinda mentioned, this year is already kind of upon us with, with the agriculture season, but we certainly can look for the framework and develop some solutions as we go forward for future critical drought years. And that's, and I thank you very much for my input. Good, thank you, Russ. I appreciate uh, your contribution to the conversation and certainly ongoing work on behalf of the agency you represent. Um, anyone else? There are no hands raised. Okay, Eric, I'll bring it back to you then, uh, unless there's any Commission comments for anything you want to close with. Again, we thank our panelists so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This was really just purely an informational item. There's a lot going on. We have the benefit of hearing from our Delta Water Master on a fairly regular basis. And I would expect that um, this might be a topic that we will revisit uh, with new and additional actions as they, uh, as they occur. But stay tuned. Um, especially if, uh, heaven forbid, we head into a dry winter, um, this is something that we'll be uh, continuing to brief this commission on. Okay, thank you. All righty, well, very good then. Um, uh, again, finally, thanks to our panelists and uh, we, we're here, you're invited back uh, and again, it may be that uh, you'll be regulars on our agenda and hopefully with the better news lying ahead for all of us, but okay. That uh, concludes in the report uh, uh, on the activities, drought activities in the Delta. And we're now down to the uh, final item on the agenda, um, which is our adjournment. Chair Natoli. Yes. Uh, we do still have item six open for voting. I know we were still trying to get Commissioner Nakanishi's vote due to the um, Zoom challenges. Okay, I'll just real quickly, uh, Alan, if you're still on the phone, uh, I know we have technical difficulties. It was just on the approval of the minutes from the May meeting, and uh, we had all eyes, but we want to give you a chance to vote on that. So if you. Eyes. Alan Makanishi, aye. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thanks, Alan. Good. Okay, closes item six out. So now we're down to 14. Uh, it may be that we will have a special meeting called, and again, Eric, you and your staff would work with commission members about. Uh, availability and then obviously do public notice and such. So. Okay. All right. Uh, commission members, anything else uh, for the good of the order? Uh, otherwise, we're going to move to adjourn. Seeing none, then uh, I want to thank all of you, thank our all of our audience, all the participants, and uh, commission staff. So we will pull a standard adjournment and um, Enjoy the rest of the evening. And thank you so much for all your contributions uh, to work uh, that benefits the Delta and uh, our state. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, yep, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.